first speaker is Clay Cordova. Okay, well, will tell us will tell us what's what what's new with Q. All right, thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to join previous speakers in thanking the organizers for hosting this great conference. In case it's not clear, the Q in my talk refers to supersymmetry. And uh, supersymmetry is obviously an enormous subject, and you can't possibly review it in an hour. And I apologize to everyone whose work is left out of what comes. I'll divide my talk into three themes. The themes are the classification of superconformal field theories in different dimensions, exact calculations in SUSY quantum field theory, and connections between SUSY and non-SUSY dynamics. Okay, let's get started. So the first problem is the classification problem. What's the statement? The goal is in each space-time dimension larger than two to classify possible superconformal field theories. So make a list. Before attacking this problem, I should tell you why it's interesting. So I'll give you three possible answers that appeal to different subsectors of the audience. The first is more physical. So SCFTs are uh, highly supersymmetric universality classes, and understanding them is a starting point to classifying the possible dynamics of quantum field theories. And I think this intuition has really been borne out uh, in the recent uh, developments in three dimensions, for instance. Another possible answer is that it's well known that SCFTs exhibit extremely rich mathematical structure. So new SCFTs might lead to new math. And finally, the special case in uh, space-time dimension three, which is a particularly difficult case, as we'll learn soon, is related holographically to ADS vacua that might be crucial to the string landscape. Okay, why is this problem well posed? Why is it finite? So there's an essential foundational result due to NOM. What NOM proved is that there is an upper bound on the space-time dimension where SCFTs are possible. So he proved that above space-time dimension six, no SCFTs are possible. This is an algebraic statement, has no physics input. No algebras exist. Now, if we also demand that we want our theories to have an energy momentum tensor, then we can bound also the total number of supercharges. I'll call it NQ. So that gives us these list of possibilities to attack. So there are six dimensions. There's two, uh, two kinds of superconformal field theories. And as we'll see, these are highly constrained by consistency. In five dimensions, there's only one possibility. And there's new examples and proposed classifications for simple enough theories. As we go down, the problem starts to get harder. In 4D, you already have four possibilities. And while there's a plausible classification for the maximally supersymmetric case, it gets harder and harder as you decrease the amount of supersymmetry. And finally, in 3D, you have this bewildering list of possibilities. And as far as I can tell, uh, classification here is wide open, maybe even impossible with current techniques, even for a very large number of supercharges. Okay, so before telling you about uh, recent progress, let me briefly overview what is the status of maximal supersymmetry. So we'll start in six dimensions. In six dimensions, we can have theories with 16 supercharges. These are the so-called two comma zero theories. And these admit a conjectural ADE classification with the A series constructed by parallel M5 brains. One way to motivate this classification is to reduce the theories on a circle to 5D super Yang Mills. So if you look on the Coulomb branch there, you find two kinds of objects. One are monopole strings, and the other are W boson particles. But they have to come intrinsically from the same six-dimensional object. That six-dimensional object is a string. And this, uh, this coincidence that they come from the same six-dimensional object requires the algebra to be simply laced. So that gives you the ADE. Now, what's going on in D equals four? That's another case where we can have maximal supersymmetry. 
There also, there's a plausible classification in terms of supersymmetric Yang-Mills theories with different gauge groups, so n equals four. But I'd like to point out that it would be interesting to know if we could make this into a theorem. One hint uh, about how that might go is that every 16 supercharged theory has an exactly marginal coupling tau. So that includes whose real part is the theta angle and the imaginary part is g squared. And the Zamolodnikov metric on the space of couplings is completely fixed by supersymmetry. And perhaps you could try to prove that there's a weak coupling limit and therefore prove that any n equals four CFT actually has to be one of the ones that you already knew about. Now this is quite tricky, it turns out. Okay, in contrast to 60 and 40, in three dimensions, there's kind of a zoo of different 3D maximally supersymmetric theories. So these all take the form of quivers. So here's a uh, quiver. It's got two gauge groups, G1 and G2. And uh, there are turn Simons levels, K and minus K. And there's bifundamental matter indicated by the arrows. What sequences of n equals eight theories do we know? Well, one that we know is this uh, Bagger, Lambert, Gustafson series, these two series. They differ by uh, whether you do or don't do a Z2 quotient. And these are maximally supersymmetric for any K. And for small K, they can be thought of as the world volume theory of M2 brains. But for general K, there's no known string theory embedding of these. So it's not known uh, why they exist or how to think about them and how to, how to organize our thoughts. There's of course another series. Uh, these are the ABJM series or ABJ series. And they have unitary groups, UN times UN, sometimes with an offset, and small turn Simons levels. And these can be thought of as the low energy limit of super Yang Mills, uh, 3D maximally supersymmetric super Yang Mills with gauge group UN, SO2N, or SO2N plus one. Okay, so I've given you several infinite families of maximally supersymmetric theories in three dimensions. But it's completely clear that this list is both incomplete and redundant. Why is it incomplete? Well, there are theories that we know that don't seem to appear anywhere. So for instance, uh, max, the low energy limit of super Yang Mills with say an exceptional gauge group is nowhere on my list. That's some 3D n equals a theory. It maybe it has a Lagrangian and we could make it more explicit. Another problem is that there are dualities, sporadic dualities relating elements in these series. And we don't yet have a complete picture of that. So perhaps we'll learn about it in Khufu's talk. One example of a duality uh, that was recently shown by this group is the following. You take this Bagger-Lambert theory, in the special case k equals three, and you add to it a free theory, uh, kind of center of mass degree of freedom, and this turns out to be dual to this ABJM theory. So that again suggests some mystery about the Bagger-Lambert theories this example is supposed to be the world volume theory of three M2 brains. And this Bagger-Lambert theory we thought had something to do maybe with two M2 brains. Anyway, it's clear from this that three dimensional maximal supersymmetry is wide open. Okay. If we move on away from maximal supersymmetry, uh, we can come down to this world of 40 N equals three theories. This is, an interesting development uh, that occurred in late 2015, these two authors constructed the first known examples of 40 CFTs with 12 supercharges. It's known that these theories are intrinsically strongly coupled. That means that they have no marginal uh, couplings. This is known just algebraically, you don't need to have an example to work it out. So that makes explicit construction and investigation challenging. How was it, how were they built? So here's the, here's the setup. You look at F theory, a 12 dimensional theory on this geometry, C3 times T2 mod ZK. And this can be thought of 
as an F-theory uplift of the ABJM geometry. And we need this ZK to act on the torus. So for k equals 1 and 2, the tau parameter of the torus can be anything. And in the end, this will lead to familiar n equals 4 theories with general tau as their coupling. For larger k, we can make ZK act on the torus if k is special and tau is special. So for instance, for k is 4, we can make z4 act on the torus if tau is frozen at i. That's the value that's invariant under s-duality. So if you probe this, this quotient with z3 brains, what you're led to is interacting 4D CFTs with 12 supercharges. And for a large number of d3 brains, these theories have an ADS dual, where the transverse geometry is a quotient of s5, and the quotient also acts as a duality in space-time. So they're quite exotic. There are some sparse results about the dynamics of these theories. One set of results uh, builds on studying this protected sector of operators called the chiral algebra, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So if you take the theory that is rank one, that is one D3 brain, you can compute some protected sector of OP coefficients, and one highlight is that you can extract the conformal central charges, A and C. They're equal, and they're both proportional to 2K minus 1, where K was that quotient parameter that appeared in the construction. We can also study the moduli spaces of these theories. So for instance, in the rank 1 case, the 1D3 ring case, we have Z3, C3 mod ZK, and you have a chiral operator of dimension K. And there are also some sparse other results. Although it might be very preliminary, let me say that I think that 4dn equals 3 theories seem like a natural candidate to try and classify and to understand better. They have a lot of supersymmetry after all. So one thing that we know a priori about them is that the moduli space of vacua is necessarily flat. That's like uh, n equals 4. So it's a flat moduli space. And if you maybe make a bold conjecture, uh, it's not clear if it's true, that there are no relations among the chiral operators. What you'd be led to is a moduli space that could be described as a quotient of a vector space by a complex reflection group. And these complex reflection groups are completely classified. And you might think that if you take an example that's a vial group, you'll get n equals 4 theories, but other complex reflection groups might give genuinely n equals 3 theories. Okay, some of you may find all this sort of distasteful. Uh, <laughs> Classification does require a little bit of a taste for the exotic, though, so I'm just going to continue. Okay, so let's talk about eight supercharges for a while. So the biggest progress in eight supercharges has been on 60 theories. So I remind you that these theories have a tensor branch, and on their moduli space, there's a two-form gauge field B, and the subtle thing about B is that it's chiral. DB is star DB. Now, what is the two-minute summary of the progress? Well, all, from the top-down point of view, all geometries that can support 60 CFTs have been constructed in F-theory. So there's a construction of local geometries. From the holographic point of view, all ADS7 solutions that could be holographically dual to CFTs have been worked out. What about from the bottom-up point of view? There, there's also been a bit of progress, and the strategy here is familiar. We deform onto the moduli space of vacua, and we try to understand the consistency conditions that we might see, like anomaly cancellation. And this has led to progress on a variety of topics, for instance, our G-flows. Now, this subject has been reviewed a lot in this conference, so I won't discuss it too much, but, uh, or in past versions of this conference, I should say. But uh, let me, before the field moves on, point out what I think are some interesting open problems that involve marrying this quantum field theory analysis to the more top-down approach uh, that was achieved here. So one open problem concerns the moduli space. So known interacting examples always have a tensor branch. They always have uh, one of these B fields. 
And you can ask why that's so. Is it just that we're looking under the lamppost and these are the things that we can see geometrically? Or is there some deep principle that makes this true? This is really important to make sure that this classification uh, really is correct and covers all possible examples. Another related problem is how many distinct interacting theories are there which at low energy look like a single free tensor multiplet? So just a single B field and its friends by supersymmetry. So rather remarkably, F theory predicts that there's exactly one of these theories, the small E8 instanton. This is very challenging to understand from a bottom-up quantum field theory point of view. Okay, for those of you who haven't been following uh, classification in six dimensions, you might wonder, why are people doing this? Why is there such intense effort and what's at stake? One possible answer is that uh, you get a big payoff by reducing from six dimensions to lower dimensions. So compactification of a 6D theory on a manifold M produces a quantum field theory in lower space-time dimensions, and sometimes you can trade problems of dynamics in the lower dimensional theory for problems of geometry on the compactification manifold M. So this means that we can often use our knowledge of 6D together with geometry to organize our thoughts about SCFTs in lower space-time dimensions. And of course, there are many famous examples of these. Let me mention one recent extension that has received a lot of attention. So, for instance, you can consider the following 6D theory. It starts with NS5 brains, that's this red dot here. And you embed them into a stack of K D6 brains. And this gives you a 6D10 theory with SUK times SUK global symmetry. And you can reduce on a surface to get uh, lots of 4D SCFTs, and there's a bunch of results about the physics of those 4D theories, starting with this 6D theory as input and using the geometry of the compactification. Now, an interesting open problem for this philosophy is to try and understand to what extent 6D CFTs are parents for all lower dimensional SCFTs. So to what extent is this philosophy really correct? Okay, let's look at five dimensions briefly. Let me remind you what a five-dimensional field theory is, or what the intuition you should have about them is. So a five-dimensional field theory you should think is a UV completion of a non-abelian gauge theory. So you start with the SCFT, and you give it a relevant deformation, and at long distances, you find a non-abelian gauge theory phase, together with some, perhaps, matter multiplets. These can be constructed in string theory using a bunch of techniques. For instance, you can take M theory, and you can put it on a geometry where a complex surface is collapsing. And then the degrees of freedom stuck at that surface uh, realize this 5D CFT. There's also recent work on holography in these examples. Now there's a long-standing puzzle in trying to understand the connection between the field theory approach to 5D CFTs and the explicit constructions that you find in string theory. So what's the nature of the puzzle? The question is, what are the correct low energy consistency conditions on the field theory? So what should we impose on a non-abelian gauge theory in five dimensions to try and check that it has a UV completion? So on the moduli space of vacua of the gauge theory, it's, a, it's an abelian theory after deforming to the moduli space. And you might ask the question, should this effective field theory make sense for all vacua that you see, or just a subregion of the moduli space? And a priori, it's not clear. But the top-down approach suggests an answer, because there are explicit string geometry constructions whose effective field theory we can work out. And in order for the field theory to be consistent with the known string constructions, it turns out that you have to use this weaker subregion idea. So you can't demand that the moduli space make sense for all vacua. And this, con some consequences of this have recently been explored. 
Let me also mention that this idea of organizing field theories uh, by compactification from six dimensions has also been recently explored, and uh, it, it's had some success. For instance, known 5D theories with less than or equal to two non-abelian gauge groups in their gauge theory phase all arise from compactification from 6D. So this is some evidence that 6D is a good organizing principle. Okay, so of course we don't just want to make lists of theories. We'd like to uh, know something about the dynamics and it's challenging when you have examples in five and six dimensions that don't have explicit Lagrangians. Let me tell you about some recent progress by this group uh, that produced some nice results about 5D CFTs. So they study the Cyberg exceptional uh, series. What's that, uh, what's that series uh, of 5D theories? Well, these are theories that in their gauge theory phase have an sp2n uh, gauge group and some number nf of fundamental hypermultiplets. And the CFT that we're interested in is a UV completion of this gauge theory. So in the UV, the gauge coupling becomes strong and we get to the fixed point. Now what's, what's so magical about these theories? Well, they have two flavor symmetries. One is an obvious flavor symmetry that acts on the hypermultiplets in the Lagrangian. And the second one is a little less obvious. It's a topological symmetry, a U1 global symmetry related to the instant on density. And the magic is at the critical point, this U1 and this flavor symmetry on the hypers combine together to form an exceptional group, ENF. So there's an enhanced global symmetry in the UV. What did this group do with these theories? They provided some very interesting results about correlation functions at the fixed point. So what they studied, for instance, are the two-point function coefficients of the stress tensor, there's a single number there, and the two-point function of two currents in this exceptional global symmetry, which is also characterized by a single number. And using uh, two different techniques, actually independently, they showed that you can compute these exactly. So here's what they found. I've divided uh, in this, uh, here's what they found for the rank one theory, that is the case n is one, with E8 flavor symmetry. And I've divided here by the example for the free hypermultiplet to make these numbers intrinsically uh, meaningful. So I find this, uh, this impressive. We, uh, just from saying the words UV completion of, of gauge theory, we can actually compute two-point function coefficients of local operators at the critical point using supersymmetry. Okay, the last thing uh, in this classification program that I'd like to tell you about is four dimensions. And uh, it's getting more challenging. It's, it's already reached the stage of big data. So for instance, this group recently produced about 50,000 isolated SCFTs. Uh, that's quite a lot. Uh, they're isolated, meaning they have no marginal couplings. And they did that just by compactifying this E820 theory on a very simple Riemann surface, the three punctured sphere, with some decorations at the punctures. And uh, one thing they did is to uh, put their results into a mineable database. So I hope that somebody will look at these and try and find some organizing principle because this is starting to get out of hand. F field theory strategies for understanding this landscape of 4D n equals 2 theories are roughly speaking divided into two approaches. The first uh, is a Coulomb branch approach. Uh, and this, in this idea, you try and directly constrain the Coulomb branch Cyborg-Witten geometry, and this works best for small theories. And it's been made into an art by these authors, and we'll hear about it soon, so I won't tell you more. The next kind of approach is a more Higgs branch approach. And that's based on some recent developments uh, relating the Higgs branch to a protected set of local operators uh, called the chiral algebra, deduced by these people. So what's the chiral algebra in a sentence? It's a VOA, a vertex operator algebra, that you can associate to any 4D n equals 2 CFT. And it's constructed from twisted correlators of local operators restricted to a plane. Now, it's intrinsically connected to the Higgs branch because the Higgs branch can be produced by taking this VOA and truncating to a commutative version of it. That's a recent result of Beam and Rastelli. 
To give you an example of how this correspondence works, we could take this sequence of Argier's Douglas theories. It's A two n minus one Argier's Douglas theory. It's known to have a Higgs branch C two mod Z n, and this is uh, related to this famous bershansky polyakov sequence of vertex operator algebras, which are drinfeld sokolov reductions of SUN katz moody OK, that's the end of the first part of the talk. Now we're moving on to calculations in supersymmetric quantum field theory. And I think it's fair to say that exact calculations are really the bread and butter of supersymmetry. This is really the grunt work. This is really where lots of exciting results are happening. And uh, there's results in different directions. It's a bit hard to find the narrative. So here I've just listed a few that we'll hear about uh, later in the conference or we've already heard about. Now there are two items on this list that I'll, uh, that I'll talk about, mostly because I find them interesting and they, haven't, and they won't be talked about otherwise. So what's the first topic? The first topic is an organizing principle for localization calculations. Now over the past decade, there's been very significant interest in computing supersymmetric partition functions and indices. So there's a huge uh, bewildering number of papers. You can consider, for instance, 3D theories on three manifolds. And you can choose different geometries here. You can look at the three sphere. This is nice. Uh, it's related to correlation functions and the F theorem. There's also geometries related to the superconformal index, and so forth and so on. And there's a parallel list in 4D. And I think it's fair to say that these partition functions have been very useful in checking dualities and lots of different applications. But it's also sort of a pain in the sense that uh, there are all these different geometries. And there doesn't seem yet, uh, until now, to have been a good organizing principle for how to think about all the different calculations that you might do. So all these different examples had to be attacked individually. So recently, this group came up with a nice organizing principle that unifies many of these calculations. So what's a clue to their method? A clue to their method is to look at the special case when M3 is a product. So let's take this three manifold that we're studying our part that where we're computing the partition function to be a product sigma g times s1. Then we can interpret the partition function as an observable in a 2D topological A model on the surface sigma g. This is the, the basic uh, observation. So we get some simple 2D topological observable. And their idea is just to try to interpret other partition functions of 3D or 4D theories as observables in this 2D theory. And we'll see that this will organize the different possible geometries and partition functions that you might choose into correlation functions of 2D local operators. So the basic picture is uh, one that's been known for a while. So for instance, suppose you have a 2D topological field theory and you want to put it on a higher genus Riemann surface. Well, because it's topological, you can change the shape of the surface without doing any damage to the partition function. And you could take a limit where a handle collapses. And when you do that, you can replace this addition of a handle by the insertion of a local operator, a handle gluing operator. So using this, for instance, we can change the genus of the Riemann surface. Now, in a partition function of a d-dimensional theory on a Riemann surface times a torus, you might want to do, introduce fluxes for background gauge fields. For instance, you have maybe some R symmetry or some flavor symmetry. And you usually think that that flux is uniformly spread over the whole Riemann surface. But you can play the same game as we played above. So what you can do is you can try to concentrate that flux at a point. And in the limit where it's completely concentrated, you can replace the flux on the Riemann surface by a 2D local flux operator. So changing the flux, that is changing the background, is again the insertion of a 2D local operator. Now, one such flux that we might want to consider is associated to the geometric vibration. So here we have a vibration of circles 
over a Riemann surface, and there are churn classes uh, telling us how these uh, circles are fibered. And we can try and pl play the same game with that flux as well. So we can concentrate it at a point. And when we do that, we can change the partition function on a circle fibration, for instance, S3, to a partition function on a product, for instance, S2 times S1, at the expense of introducing a 2D local operator. So a point in this example on S2. So there's some vibration operator in the problem, just like there's a handle gluing operator. So uh, I should also mention that there's a 2D local operator that allows us to introduce orbifold singularities in the vibration, i.e. turn the manifold into a ciphered uh, manifold. And this, uh, I think, is based on work that is to appear by the same authors. Now, what is a 2D local operator? I've said that we can change the, the partition function background that we're considering at the price of introducing 2D local operators. Now, a local disturbance in 2D in the geometry that we're considering uplifts to defect operators in the higher dimensional theory. So, in 3D, a 2D local operator will uplift to a line, and in 4D, it will uplift to a surface. So we end up with the following nice statements. Say, for instance, in 3D, the partition function of a 3D n equals 2 theory on a cipher 3 manifold, so a circle bundle over a Riemann surface with orbifold singularities, can be understood as a correlation function of line defects on the fixed background S2 times S1, where the lines wrap the circle. So we don't have to consider different geometries and different partition functions, we can always work here and in just introduce some lines that allow us to change the topology or the vibration. And there's a parallel statement in 4D where uh, we work on S2 times T2 and we introduce surface defects wrapping the torus. I find this very nice. It organizes a huge class of partition functions into correlation functions of defect operators. Okay, let me tell you about one other localization calculation. And this is based on 2-0 deconstruction. So as you saw in the first part of my talk, the 6D maximally supersymmetric theory plays a very starring role in the story of SCFTs. But we don't really know, uh, or we're not completely sure, what is this theory? And we don't really know how to study it quantitatively. There have been various ideas proposed. Here are some of them. And one that has been not so much explored is this idea of dimensional deconstruction due to these authors. Let me remind you of what that story is. So the starting point is a 4D quiver gauge theory with eight supercharges. And this quiver has n nodes, so here's the picture, n nodes. And each node has an SUK gauge group, and there's bifundamental matter indicated by the links. How is it related to the 2-0 theory? What you do is that you give all the hypermultiplets a correlated expectation value. So you move on to the Higgs branch. That Higgs is the gauge group to SUK with a single gauge coupling. Then you consider the limit of large n and v and gauge coupling g, keeping the following expressions fixed. The claim of these authors is that at long distances, this realizes the 62, 0 theory of Km fibrains on a torus with sides ri. So the, the torus has become finite size because of these limits. And this is an interesting construction because the 4D theory is UV complete, so it might have a chance to give really a well-defined definition of the 62 theory. Okay, this is a nice idea, but it's languished for a while. How can we make it more quantitative? What can we do to really test that this is correct? Well, recent progress was made by this group. They provide some quantitative checks on this idea. The first thing that they did 
is to look at the partition function of half BPS primary operators in the 2-0 theory. This is known, it takes this particularly simple form. And you can guess this, uh, this form in a simple way by looking at the coordinates on the moduli space of vacua. So for instance, you have uh, one coordinate, uh, one gauge invariant coordinate in each degree, and here I've made a simple generating function that counts products of those. So the first thing that this group did is to show that exactly this partition function uh, is reproduced by the Higgs branch primary operators in the quiver gauge theory, in the deconstruction limit. Okay. Now, this might have impressed people in the 90s, but um, these days, we all think we have to do better than half BPS operators. And the authors of this paper agree. So, <laughs> they have also studied S4 partition functions. So what did they do? They used exact localization and they computed the S4 partition function of the 4D theory in the deconstruction limit. That's a highly non-trivial calculation. And they match it to known expressions for the S4 times T2 partition function of the 6020 theory. These match exactly in the deconstruction limit. This is quite impressive. I think this is motivation to work harder and l try to learn more about the 2-0 theory using this approach. Okay, so we come now to the last part of the talk, and that's about connections between SUSY and non-SUSY dynamics. So we heard yesterday about lots of recent exciting progress in 3D non-supersymmetric quantum field theories. And these results all have cousins in the supersymmetric world. Let me give you an example. One of the first instances known of 3D n equals 4 mirror symmetry is the following statement. You take a U1 gauge theory with two hypermultiplets of charge 1, and this theory is self-dual and therefore flows in the infrared to a CFT with enhanced SU2 times SU2 global symmetry. Now, this statement has a non-supersymmetric analog, which is that U1 gauge theory with two electrons of charge 1 is self-dual and conjecturally flows to a CFT with enhanced global symmetry in the same enhancement pattern. Now, when you see statement like this, it's natural to ask if you can try to uh, smoothly connect these SUSY and non-SUSY dualities. So in 3D, this has been done for large n turn simons matter dualities in these papers, and it's also been explored at small n in this, uh, by this group. So here I'd like to ask if we can use this idea to guess the IR behavior of gauge theories in 4D. So this is the idea of soft supersymmetry breaking. So what do you do? You start with a Lagrangian that's supersymmetric, uh, and hopefully that you've uh, analyzed and know something about the infrared. And you add to it a mass term for the scalars. So m squared phi squared, phi means all the scalars here, or maybe some of them. And if you really want this to work, it's uh, best to work in the case where the mass operator satisfies a few constraints. First, it should be positive definite, and I've written it in that way here. The reason that is is that often SUSY theories have moduli spaces of vacua, and so if you uh, add something with the wrong sign, you'll get a runaway. It should also be part of a short multiplet, so we can track it and use the power of supersymmetry. And finally, uh, ideally, we'd like this mass operator to preserve all the symmetries in our problem, so that all Tuft anomalies are maintained and all symmetries are maintained for any M. So this is a stringent list, and it's not so easy to find examples of mass operators like that. This problem of soft SUSY breaking was explored in four dimensions uh, in the heyday of duality by these groups. Now, in general, even if you can find such a mass, which is not guaranteed, you face the following challenge. The regime where you have control over the problem is small m. That's the supersymmetric regime. But the regime where you really want to know the answer is large m. That's the non-supersymmetric regime. So, what's the philosophy for using uh, soft supersymmetry breaking? 
Well, we'll take a kind of loose philosophy and use this, uh, this idea to propose candidate phases for the non susie theory. But because of this objection, we can never be sure which, if any, of our candidate phases holds dynamically. But at the very least, if we can find a mass operator like this, we can be sure that any uh, candidate phases that we generate from this technique will match all Tuft anomalies automatically. So at least we'll pass some stringent consistency checks. Okay, this is some philosophy, but the real proof of the pudding of this, me this method will have to be in the eating. So let me give you a test case. So an ideal test case is adjoint QCD with two vile fermion flavors of adjoint quarks. Let me call them lambda i. The index i is a doublet under a chiral SU2 global symmetry. What is believed to happen in the infrared of this theory? So the lore is that this theory confines and undergoes chiral symmetry breaking. And this chiral symmetry breaking is driven by a chiral condensate. Uh, here it is. This fermion bilinear gets a non-zero expectation value. And this leads to a nonlinear sigma model in the infrared of Nambu Goldstone bosons on CP1. Now, this is lore. Is this really correct? And if so, what are the couplings in the sigma model? So in a new paper that just appeared while I was talking, we construct candidate phases for this theory with gauge group SU2 by embedding it into pure n equals 2 super Yang mills. So what do we do here? This adds a complex adjoint scalar phi. And the IR of this n equals 2 theory is completely solved by Cyborg and Witten. And as everybody knows, there is a moduli space of vacua controlled by this operator u. What's the infrared physics? At generic u, there's uh, a u1 vector multiplet. And at two special points, there are additional uh, light hypermultiplets, and the infrared is n equals 2 super QED. So let's now apply this soft SUSY breaking idea to this example. So this mass operator phi squared satisfies all the conditions that I wanted. It's positive definite, and it can be tracked to the infrared, and it preserves all the symmetries of the problem. The reason it can be tracked is that phi squared is the primary of the n equals 2 stress tensor multiplet. So we can find that easily in the infrared. And here it is. There's an expression like this. Phi squared is related to this nice formula in, in terms of A and A dual, where A and A dual are the usual uh, special coordinates on the geometry. So this is some potential on the moduli space. And you can work out what that potential does. And this is completely reliable at small m. So at small m, we find that this potential traps you at the origin of moduli space. So what are the remaining massless fields? They are an IR gageno and a free photon. So that's a candidate phase for adjoint QCD. And it's quite exotic. Let me summarize some of its properties. So the gageno that we found in the infrared that's still there is a doublet under the global SU2 symmetry. That means that chiral symmetry is unbroken. The free photon that's here means the theory is deconfined, and even in a Coulomb phase. An even more exotic feature is that you find that the gauge coupling of the photon is pinned exactly at the self-dual value, tau equals i. This is because there is a UV symmetry, a discrete R symmetry, that acts in the infrared by S-duality. And that forces tau to be stuck at i. Now this is quite exotic, but I stress that because of the way I produced it, it's guaranteed that this phase matches all Tuft anomalies. So we should take it a little bit seriously. And the big question we should ask is, does this phase persist as the soft mass is increased? I should also point out that this phase is closely connected 
to some recent conjectures about adjoint QCD by these, uh, these groups. Okay, so we should look at the special points in the Coulomb branch. So let's look at u is plus or minus lambda squared. Lambda is the strong coupling scale. There the theory is super QED, and there's a charge one hypermultiplet, h, in a doublet of the SU2 global symmetry. So let's look at the scalar potential for this hypermultiplet, h, and the vector multiplet scalar. I'll call it sigma. So first focus on this part here. That's the part that's there just by supersymmetry. It gives you a quartic positive piece for the hypermultiplet h, and it gives h a mass if sigma is non-zero. That's the statement that h is only massless if you sit at the monopole point. Now here is the soft breaking term, which we can track. The most striking thing that you should look at is that it comes with a negative sign for h. That's fixed completely by supersymmetry. Let's be bold and naively extrapolate to large M. This is, as I stressed before, uncontrolled, but we'll at least get a phase that's consistent with conditions like anomaly matching. What do we find if we extrapolate to large M? We find that H would eventually condense. What happens when H condenses? Well, H is a doublet of SU2. And if a doublet condenses, we'll break SU2 to U1. And that's the CP1 model that we expected. So here we see that N equals 2 contains within it the necessary light degrees of freedom for confinement and chiral symmetry breaking in adjoint QCD. The embedding in SuperQED also allows us to determine a bunch of subtle things uh, that we uh, are interested in about this CP1 model. So we, there's lots of topological couplings, and they affect the soliton physics, and we'd like to know what they are. Let me give you one highlight. From this discussion, you can work out that the 2D confining string of adjoint QCD is in fact a 2D topological insulator. You can give the fermions a mass, and flow to pure Yang Mills with zero theta angle. And this mass term gaps the bulk. So the 4D becomes, uh, the CP1 model is lifted and we just have a single vacuum. But the topological insulator on the, on the uh, confining string persists for some masses because it's protected by symmetry. As you increase the mass, you eventually you reach a critical point and the string undergoes a phase transition to a trivial phase on its world volume. This comes about because a 2D Dirac zero mode uh, becomes massless on the string. And you can see that explicitly in this n equals two supersymmetric embedding. All this happens while the bulk remains mass massive. Okay, so this is just a hint, but there's more in the paper. I'm done early, I think. Let me sum up. In conclusion, let me say that from the first part of the talk, I think it's clear that the universe of supersymmetric field theories is vast and growing, and each theory is a potential playground for lots of applications in mathematical physics. New exact results in supersymmetry are teaching us a lot about the guts of quantum field theory, and I really hope that work on that will continue. And finally, I think I think there's lots more to explore in the relationship between supersymmetric and non-supersymmetric theories. Thanks very much. Thanks, Clay, for a very nice review. We have time for questions, for sure. I think there's one there. Zohar has his hand up. Thanks, very nice uh, talk. Um, I got confused about the last part. There is also a Z8 chiral symmetry that you did not mention, which is expected to be spontaneously broken. It's spontaneously broken. Um, there's two CP1s yeah. because the, there's, two mono, there's a monopole and dion point and the right. same physics happens. Yeah, people expect a few copies of the CP1. Yeah, you get two copies. Yeah. And there should be a non-trivial domain world between the two. Yeah, CP1s. we didn't study the domain world. That would be very interesting to do.
So uh, very interesting, and in fact related to the same uh, theory. Have you tried embedding it in string theory? Uh, no, we have not tried that, but that would also be interesting. I agree with the two previous questions. It was a good talk, thank you. Uh, and again about the, this last point. What was the role of the, the other solution you had with the massless fermion and the photon? I didn't understand the relation between that and the CP1. Oh, good. So, I mean, in, the, in this world of soft supersymmetry breaking, since I'm really interested in large mass, I can't reliably tell you which of the two phases persists. All I can really quantitatively tell you is that parametrically small mass, the theory at the origin, the deconfined phase, is the one that's there. And in order to see the confinement, you would have to, be, you would have to be kind of gutsy and extrapolate to large mass. So we speculate a bit about the phase transition that might occur, but it's really speculation. So in the theory at the origin, is, there is confinement. There is no confinement. It's, there's no confinement. There's a free photon. You refer to another paper. Yes. Uh, that's so not what they said. Th that's not what they said. That, their theory is related to, to another candidate phase that you would get if you just went to a generic point on the Coulomb branch. So imagine you, for some magic reason, are just stuck at a generic point on the Coulomb branch. Then you'll get um, a free photon, and you can Higgs it. And then you'll get the phase that they get. But will it confine then or not? Then it will confine, yeah. So that's a phase with confinement, but no chiral symmetry breaking. A more general and less sophisticated question. So I really um, appreciate all these results you're describing and earlier speakers did, where you have um, translated some of the lessons into non-supersymmetric theories. Um, but one very basic thing that happens when you allow yourself to break supersymmetry is that you can have time-dependent dynamics, so you can send the scalar field rolling along even if you have a moduli space. Do any of these techniques uh, make progress on deriving the time-dependent dynamics of rolling scalar fields? For example, it'd be nice, you know, although probably too ambitious, to derive the Born-Enfeld action um, in the non-abelian age theories and so on. Uh, I think the answer is no. I, I, I don't, I, none of that is being used. So the kind of thing you can uh, use the SUSY theories for is... Well, maybe you can do it. more, but here all we're, all we're really doing is saying that someone solved for us the SUSY theory, uh -huh. figured out the RG flow, and using that, there are some operators who's, that we can define in the UV that we can find in the IR. That's really what we're doing. That, that's really the main input. I have a technical question. I didn't understand the formula for absolute phi squared in terms of A and AD. Could you flash that? Yeah. Uh, Are there some bars missing there? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so it's, you're saying that the Kähler potential yeah, yeah, is yes, renormalized? Yes. Yeah, sorry, this should be A, yep. a dual bar right, minus right, right. A bar. A dual. So you're saying the Kähler potential is unrenormalized or something like that? You can match the exact Kähler potential. This is the, so the, you can ask how do I how What do I does prove the this? wiggle mean? There's a uh, four pi missing. Oh, okay. So you're saying that the, you're saying the Kähler potential is not renormalized. I'm saying more than that. So, um, so you could ask how does this matching work? So the way it works is that in the UV, phi squared is the primary of the n equals 2 stress tensor multiplet. That's the first statement. Then in the infrared, you should find a stress tensor multiplet. So if you put the correct version of this formula with the bars on a, this one and this one, then that's the primary of some stress tensor multiplet. But they might differ by improvements, the two stress tensor multiplets. And you have to check that this is really the right thing, even including improvements. So that's something you can work out. Any other questions, comments? Um, no? Okay. Well, let's thank Blake. <laughs> Our next speaker is Phil Orgers.
Okay, so um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Is that, is that the OA? Is that good? Um, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, this uh, in uh, Clay's uh, nice review, what he characterized as a bottom-up um, classification program. Uh, we'll try to constrain the possible space of four-dimensional n equals two quantum field theories by systematically classifying their Coulomb branch geometries. And whenever you do try to do something systematically, you have to be very careful. The, the main, uh, that you don't miss any, uh, that you don't slip in any un, uh, unobvious assumptions, um, the main problem with this is going to try to figure out Physically, what are the constraints on the kinds of singularities that are allowed in Coulomb branch geometry? So I'll start a little slowly just to talk about the, uh, well, to set the language and my base, some basic assumptions. Um, we all know that the Coulomb branch is a component of the moduli space of vacua of, of n equals two theories, where there are abelian gauge fields. Um, uh, we'll call the complex dimension at the metrically smooth points of, uh, of the Coulomb branch, uh, the rank, which is also the rank of the abelian gauge group. And, um, and uh, the, the geometry is a special Kähler geometry at those regular points, as follows from n equals two supersymmetry. And the uh, vacuum are, are coordinatized by BEVs of, of, uh, of the scalars in these vector multiplets. And so a little bit think about what it means to have a Coulomb branch, a, a moduli space of vacua. It says that, um, that it, the space should be a metrically complete space. Um, and however, the metric can have non-analyticities, which I'll call singularities. And another thing I want to emphasize which is a metric singularity need not be a singularity in the manifold sense or, or a singularity in the complex structure. And we'll come back to this in some uh, examples later. So the first assumption is that the large distance asymptotics of the Coulomb branches that we'll look at will be scale invariant. Basically, this is encoding the assumption that the field theories that these Coulomb branches can arise from, come from flows from a UV fixed point, which we'll assume to be a, a conformal field theory. Okay? So our classification is only going to try to constrain uh, such field theories. In other words, things that flow from superconformal field. Um, the, uh, when we talk about uh, that an RG flow in this usual picture, um, we should bear in mind that when you have a moduli space of vacua, the RG flow looks uh, a little different. The fixed point has a whole space of vacua. Here I've written our conformal vacuum plus some sort of scale invariant Coulomb uh, branch and maybe a Higgs branch. And when we deform it, the long distance, that is to say long distance on the, uh, on the moduli space, the large VEV asymptotics stay the same. Those reflect the UV behavior. And whatever the crossover scale of our RG flow is, will we'll change the, 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 uh, the structure of the moduli space on those distances. So you can kind of think of it as saying that uh, for a given quantum field theory, the, uh, the Coulomb branch geometry gives some kind of map of the RG flow, with the asymptotics being the UV and the sort of infrared behavior being at, at uh, shorter distances on the, on the Coulomb branch. So um, the, uh, the metric singularities occur where uh, charge states become light, which is where the, uh, the central charge vanishes. And this is some, uh, 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 it depends holomorphically on the coordinates on the Coulomb branch. However, uh, we have to put in a technical assumption that that metric singul locus of metric singularities is actually a complex analytic set to avoid things like the 
possible occurrence of natural boundaries. Um, and still, if we have these two assumptions, you could still imagine many possibilities for what our uh, Coulomb branch can look like. Uh, strange complex structures, and, and as well as the red dots mean some sort of metric singularities. So we are going to make a set of further assumptions just to simplify the problem. And then the idea will be we'll try to lift, or I'll talk a little bit about what's involved in lifting some of these assumptions. Uh, later on. I'm not going to try to, uh, to probe these assumptions. So the first one is, say, let's just look at dimension one. Um, uh, that sound makes it pretty simple. Um, I'll simplify even, even further by saying the topology is just a, a, a real two-dimensional plane. But actually, more to the point, the complex structure is the complex structure of the complex plane. Um, then the, 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 then this picture is literally correct for the metric structure of the Coulomb branch. It is some sort of asymptotic cone with some set of finite number of isolated points where the metric has some kind of uh, uh, non-analyticity. Oops, sorry. Um, but as a, even though the, the metric never components don't diverge, it's, so it's still a perfectly good metric space. In addition, there'll be another assumption, an assumption that there are no interacting rank zero superconformal field theories. These are the analogs of the, the question that Clay asked about the, whether there are interacting uh, two zero theories with no tensor branches. And I'll come back to later why we have to make this assumption and whether it can be lifted. So, um, if you use this special Kähler structure, uh, if you probe the vicinity of a singularity, so you ask for what are the allowed scaling behaviors of singular metrics that pres preserve a special Kähler structure and a unitarity bound coming from a, from a, a or scale invariant uh, theories, um, then you find that there is a certain uh, set of conjugacy classes of of electric magnetic duality monodromies, which are allowed, in e and there is one different singular geometry for each of these conjugacy classes. And here's the list. Um, the, the scale invariant ones are, look just like locally, like flat cones with some opening angle, which is 2 pi over the scaling dimension of the Coulomb branch parameter. And here they are. I've given them a name, which coincides with the, the name of a singular fiber elliptic fibers in the Kodaira classification. Uh, the I0 is the trivial thing. There's no singularity. And so you get this list of, uh, of, of seven uh, different scaling dimensions. And they're associated with different electric magnetic duality. Um, there's also uh, non-scale invariant uh, uh, solutions where you have sort of logarithmic corrections, which you can't scale away as you approach the, the branch. And they form two infinite series, um, uh, the IN and IN star, which we'll come back to uh, in a minute. But if I want scale invariant geometries, then I'm, list, I'm, I, I'm constrained to this list of, of, uh, uh, of seven possibilities. And those are the possibilities for our long distance asymptotes. So here's our picture. We have one of these scale invariant sing singularities. And now we're just going to try to say, what are all the possible complex deformations that preserve a special Kähler structure? And what, what happens is that this singularity can only split into some other set of those singularities on the list. And there are various constraints. You know, one main constraint is that the, the total, the monodromy, the electric magnetic book, duality monodromy around this singularity has to be the same as the product of the monodromies around these guys. Um, but if you just uh, write down the, the, the total number of pattern uh, uh, of such splittings, this kind of topological data, if you like, there are many hundreds of possibilities. Um, now, we know that there is certain maximal deformations um, uh, which is you take any one of those scale invariant singularities, and then there's a deformation 
um, in which they split into the into some number n of the i1 singularities. n is characteristic of which scale and uh, singularity you started. Um, so for instance, you could take the type 2 star singularity and it would break into 10 i1. That would be the minahan nemeshansky E8 theory, for those of you who are familiar with it. Um, but in any case, it's some geometry, and it's, just a, it's really a family of Coulomb branch geometries, depending on these complex deformation parameters live in some space, I'll call M maximal. Um, now, it turns out that all these other deformation, possible uh, deformation geometries that I talked about are simply restrictions of these, ge of these set, this, this set of seven possible geometries, to some subspaces of their moduli spaces. And we spent a lot of time actually showing this, a lot of work, but it was recently pointed out by Kaorsi and Cecati, you can map this problem onto a problem of the complex geometry of uh, smooth elliptic, compact elliptic surfaces, and that's been studied uh, uh, for centuries, and, uh, or maybe a century, and those results could actually, this result can actually be let, read off from the math letter. So that might seem uninteresting, that there's seven possibilities, and uh, everything else is just a restriction of those to subspaces, but the key point is that this, you can have inequivalent infrared physics by restricting to a subspace. And so the, these submaximal deformations should be, are qualitatively different from a physics point of view than the maximal deformations, and we should distinguish them as inequivalent theories. And that's the key point of, of what we did. So let me uh, illustrate this for you in a simple example. The IN singularity is, arises on a Coulomb branch from simply a free U1 gauge theory with N charge 1 massless hypermultiplets. This theory, clearly in this theory, I can turn on now relative masses for these, these hypermultiplets. It has N minus 1 relative masses. And, now, and if I do that, that gives an N minus 1 parameter space of deformations where I split this IN singularity into N I1 singularity. So this is, if you like, a kind of maximal deformation of this IN singularity. But we also know the IN singularity instead can arise from a U1 gauge theory with a single hypermultiplet, but instead of charge 1, it has charge square root of N. That's because the, the N in the IN singularity comes from the contribution to the beta function of the matter which goes as the square of the charge. So this last interpretation of this singularity doesn't have any relative mass deformation. It cannot be deformed. If you turn on the, the, the mass for the single hyper, all it does is move that singularity around, but it doesn't deform it. So we see that there's two versions of, of there's two different theories that could, in the infrared, correspond to an IN singularity, either one that can be further split and deformed, as in the maximal deformation case, but ones that are frozen, that can't be deformed. So, and this is already familiar in the simplest Lagrangian examples. Um, for instance, SU2 with uh, four flavors, that's an I0 star singularity split to six I1s, but SU2 with a single adjoint hyper, which is also called the, sometimes the N equals two star theory, is an N I0 star split to two I1s and an I4. And that's, this latter geometry is simply a restriction of, of this geometry. This had four mass parameters. This has one mass parameter. I, I tuned those four mass parameters in a certain way. Nevertheless, these are clearly distinct informal fields. And not all possible restrictions are allowed, it, consistent with this interpretation, because I, in the set of of frozen INs, there's the, the, char the unit of charge goes as the square root of N. So that set of Ns better be commensurate to be consistent with Dirac quantization. So now if you do this and just uh, classify all the possibilities, you find 28 possible Planck 1 geometry, which is a nice reduction from hundreds. At the time we did this, there, though there were only 11 known rank 1 informal field theories, so it still seemed like too many. 
but nevertheless, that's what we found. Um, one thing is you can ask, if I'm restricting the mass parameters and the mass is transforming the adjoint, aren't I just, are, are the flavor symmetry al algebras of these, of the submaximal theories simply related to the ones of the maximal theories? So if I did a restriction of the minahan nimashansky e 8 theory, is it just some adjoint breaking of E8 that I'm going to find? And the answer is no. And the basic reason is that the flavor symmetry cannot be unambiguously determined just from this Coulomb branch geometry data. Um, the Coulomb branch geometry data gives you a complex, a certain discrete complex reflection group and a flavor charge lattice. And the, this, al this data allows a finite number of possible uh, flavor symmetries, such that the vial group of the flavor group is a subgroup of the complex reflection group, and the root lattice is a finite index sublet. So um, this and oh, I should mark, remark, by the way, that in all the cases that we found in this classification, it turns out this, this a priori complex reflection group turns out to be actually a vial group. And um, uh, it's not exactly clear why. It, physically, we expect uh, uh, flavor symmetry algebras. Of course, they're Lie algebras. So their vial groups should be vial groups. And it's not clear from the math why that had to be the case. Um, some of this ambiguity in the assignment of the, of the flavor symmetries can be lifted by demanding consistency under the RG flow. You know, by tu making, tuning the masses in special ways, effectively, I can flow to certain uh, infrared fixed points from a given fixed point. And of course, each of these fixed points is in our classification as well. And so I can try all different assignments of the of the allowed flavor symmetries for each of these and see if they're all consistent with the pattern of uh, flavor symmetry breaking that I should expect in turning on the masses. So, um, so this, does, this, this, this reduces this ambiguity considerably. And in one of the 28 cases, it actually removes the geometry completely. There is no consistent assignment of flavor um, symmetries uh, in the flow, and so it, it can't correspond to it. Uh, okay, so we're down to 27 geometry. So <clears throat> this whole classification depended on interpreting the IN and IN star singularities as infrared free gauge theories. I talked about this as a U1. This is an SU2 infrared free gauge theory. It, that was so that we could use this direct quantization condition. Um, if there existed interacting rank zero conformal field theory, that is, interacting conformal field theories with n equals two supersymmetry and no Coulomb branch, and they had a global flavor symmetry, then by weakly gauging a U1 or SU2 subgroup of that flavor symmetry, I would then get a theory which would give an IN or an IN star singularity. These would be non-free fixed points. But then I wouldn't know anymore what the kind of charge quantization unit was in these theories, and so I wouldn't be able to, to rule out the, uh, the... I wouldn't be able to deduce that if I... that a, that a submaximal deformation that ended at an IN star singularity necessarily had uh, uh, charges quantized in root, units of square root of N. So our classification program would have collapsed. Basically, we would have hundreds of possible distinct rank one planar geometry. So that's why I made that assumption that there were no rank zero conformal field theories. Alternatively, the success of our classification program could be used as evidence for the non-existence of rank zero conformal field theories, or maybe the non-existence of ones with certain central charges or flavor or symmetry and so forth. So how do we uh, evaluate the success of this of this uh, program, well, we can try to compare it to known rank one superconformal field theories. And by known, I mean ones that we know by any of these various constructions that, that Clay uh, uh, mentioned before. In a, and in addition, uh, there is, a, a, I think, a construction that I think is at the moment still uh, separate from these, uh, which follows from uh, taking some of these theories and gauging certain of their discrete global symmetries. 
um, as the closely related to this uh, S-fold construction of um, uh, Garcia, Extabaria, and Regalado, um, there was the observation that there are discrete symmetries which don't break the supersymmetry but nevertheless act on the Coulomb branch. So when you do this, we find that of the 27 consistent geometries, 25 are now associated to known conformal field theories. And there are four cases where the same geometry corresponds to two different field theories, usually field theories with different assignments of the flavor limit. So as far as I know, this map from conformal field theories to our, these geometries is neither one-to-one -one nor onto. Um, maybe the other two will be found or not. Does this count as success? I don't know. Okay, so I have, uh, uh, I think, uh, let me comment on, on the, another assumption that we made was the assumption that, uh, uh, that the Coulomb branch was, as a complex structure, just the complex plane. That's the same as the statement that the UV conformal field theory, uh, its chiral ring, which was, was uh, freely generated. And because we're in rank one, that means just with one, uh, uh, with freely generated on one uh, generator. But you could imagine having a complex, having a singularity in the complex structure. Here's a simple example where it's generated on two, but there's, they satisfy a relation. A cubed is equal to B squared, which clearly has a complex singularity at the origin. And in terms of the normalizing coordinate, it looks like, again, just like the U plane, but now with a complex singularity at the origin. Uh, because A and B are, um, are uh, vacuum expectation values, of some conform local operators in the conformal field theory, unitarity says that their dimensions are greater than one. But that does not mean that this Coulomb branch parameter is, it's not the VEV of anything, and its dimension can now be less than one without violating the unitarity bound. So if we didn't have a, uh, this assumption, then we, didn't, we wouldn't have had this unitarity constraint. And then it turns out that there's an infinite number of of uh, singular geometries for each monodromy class. And they, they're characterized, these new ones are characterized by having sort of negative curvatures localized at the tips of the cone. Um, there's no known examples of these from any other construction. Um, and we, we were able to show that if a Coulomb branch has a complex singularity, then under any relevant deformation, a, a singularity persists. So if such theories existed, then they would form a separate set under RG. That's all we know how, what to say at rank. And it, much less is known at rank greater than one. Uh, two results is that we can construct by this discrete gauging procedure conformal field theories with Coulomb branches which have complex singularities. So at least at rank, ranks greater than one, there's a counterexample to the assumption that the Coulomb branches have to be um, uh, freely the Coulomb branch chiral rings have to be freely generated. Um, another uh, notable uh, result is that um, we've figured out in the case that the Coulomb, the complex structure is simple, that we can compute the set of allowed Coulomb branch scaling dimensions as a function of rank for any rank. And I should say both of these results were actually also independently found by these people. Um, okay. I will end there. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Phil. Uh, we have time for questions, uh, comments. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand the motivation such a proposed one-to-one -one map between the geometries and the field theory. You argue that that's not the case. Uh, I didn't, I didn't propose that it was one-to-one. -one. I right. just proposed. But why would anybody think you would? I, Is there any reason? I, I, don't, I don't think. By looking at these, this would only constrain the set of, of quantum field theories. I don't think there's a good reason for having expected that it be one. Okay. I think there's another... A potentially interesting physical constraint on the Coulomb branch geometries. Uh, in these theories, you can use the SU2R symmetry to twist it, 
And so then you can put these theories on a four manifold, general four manifold. And um, for some, excuse me, for some four manifolds, um, um, there's going to be a non-trivial measure on the Coulomb branch. And that measure has to be single valued. And in the seven cases that you wrote, uh, you well, I haven't checked all of them, but the ones I've checked, it's very non-trivial that the measure is single valued. There's lots of potential phases from various factors that cancel in non-trivial ways. And so I think that might be an interesting extra criterion to impose. I'll say that in, in, in one of our papers, we, um, we did something along those lines, which is that we used this Coulomb, the, 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 Coul the Coulomb branch measure for the twisted theory to compute the, a, the conformal and current algebra central charges using you know, following Shapir and Tachikawa. And on the way of doing that, we effectively tested the single valuedness of, of that measure in many of these cases. But I agree that we have not done it. Any other questions, <clears throat> comments? OK, let's thank Philip. <laughs>
Um, I'd like to start by um, thanking the organizers for um, such a good conference and also for inviting me here to speak. Um, I'll be talking mostly about um, these two papers. Um, the first one is in collaboration with Nathan Agmon and um, Shai Chester, and the second one uh, with Shai Chester and Xi Yin. Um, and, but I also mentioned results from uh, previous work. So the motivation for this talk is to learn about uh, gravity or string theory or M theory um, from conformal field theories. And I think it's fair to say that many of the talks at this conference um, share this motivation. Um, what I'll be focusing on is um, three-dimensional uh, conformal field theories uh, with supersymmetry, in fact, with maximal supersymmetry, that is n equal 8 in three dimensions, that have uh, gravity duals. Um, when comparing such theories with similar theories in other uh, numbers of dimensions, they have various features that I think make them uh, good for studying. Um, uh, they have explicit Lagrangians, so one can do computations. Um, they have um, no marginal coupling constants, um, which might mean they're um, more constrained. Um, although, a full class, as Clay emphasized, the full classification of n equal 8 uh, superconformal field theories is not um, known. Um, and uh, one can use supersymmetry. The most well understood example is the duality between M theory on ADS4 times S7 and um, ABJM theory with uh, UN times UN gauge group and Chern Simons levels k and minus k at Chern Simons level k equal 1. If the Chern Simons level is not equal to 1, then this S7 gets replaced by S7 mod zk. For general k, the theory doesn't have n equal 8 supersymmetry. Um, uh, uh, supersymmetry is enhanced to n equal 8 only when k equals 1 and 2. But for concreteness, let's just focus on k equal 1. And why am I giving this talk now? Well, because in the past 10 years or so, there's been a lot of progress in quantum field theory calculations, both using supersymmetry, the technique of supersymmetric localization, as well as using conformal bootstrap. Um, and what I want to ask is, what do these calculations tell us about um, M theory? And to make the question more concrete, I can give an example. Um, one can compute the S3 using supersymmetric localization. One can compute the S3 partition function of ABJM theory. It can be written as an n-dimensional integral. Um, one can evaluate the integral. And this quantity surely contains information about M theory that goes beyond supergravity. So the question is, what is this information precisely? What can we extract from it? And I guess I'll try to start answering this question in this talk. Um, and uh, what I'll do is to reconstruct the M theory um, S matrix perturbatively at small momentum. So um, compute scattering amplitudes of gravitons and superpartners in um, 11 dimensions. Equivalently, you could think about um, reconstructing the derivative expansion of the M-theory effective action, um, which schematically takes this form. Uh, it starts with the Einstein-Hilbert term um, uh, and uh, its supersymmetric completion. It gets completed into um, uh, supergravity uh, in 11 dimensions. And, uh, but then there are higher derivative corrections. The next higher derivative correction is understood to be uh, with six more derivatives. The Einstein-Hilbert term has two. This one has eight. Um, and it's a specific contraction of four, uh, product of four Riemann tensors as well as their supersymmetric completion. And um, um, then their higher order terms. But the Lagrangian is uh, messy. It has field redefinition ambiguities. It may not be um, well-defined uh, past the first few terms. Um, so instead, I'll just focus on the, on the S matrix. Um, and in this talk, I will restrict. So I was thinking about scattering uh, gravitons and their superpartners, and I'll be restricting their momenta to be in four out of the 11 dimensions. It would be interesting to generalize it and not have this restriction. 
So because I'm restricting the momenta of the gravitons to be in four out of the 11 dimensions, I can use a four-dimensional language. Um, and from the four-dimensional point of view, uh, we can, so from the 11 dimensional point of view, we're scattering gravitons and their super partners from the four dimensional point of view. We're also scattering gravitons and the super partners. And now the super partners are um, gravitinos, gravitotons, gravitotinos, and, and uh, 35 scalars and 35 pseudoscalars, which is the uh, field content of n equal 8 um, supergravity in four dimensions. Okay. Now, what do these scattering amplitudes? look like? Well, at leading order in small momentum, that is at order momentum squared, the scattering amplitudes uh, in 11 dimensions where the momenta are restricted to four dimensions are just the scattering amplitudes in n equal 8 supergravity in four dimensions at tree level. These amplitudes depend on the kind of particle that we're scattering from this list. So for example, if we're scattering um, gravitons, say these are two negative helicity gravitons and these are two positive helicity gravitons, then the scattering amplitude takes this form um, where this is written in uh, the um, spinner helicity formalism. Uh, one defines uh, angle brackets and square brackets. The details are not, are not um, very important. Uh, the point I want to make is that the scattering amplitude of leading order depends on the kind of particle that we're scattering. So if we're scattering, for instance, scalar particles from here, uh, so if, if these are two distinct scalar particles um, that correspond to gravitons in 11D that are polarized in orthogonal directions, then the scattering amplitude is, is this. Scatter amplitudes depend on the kind of particle, but they're all related by supersymmetry, and they can all be found using formulas in um, Hen Henrietta and Newton's book which I highly recommend for uh, reading. Um, so this is at leading order in small momentum. What do the scattering amplitudes look like um, beyond that? Um, well, they take the form of a momentum expansion. And although at leading order, the amplitude depends on the kind of particle, um, and this will appear at, at um, all subsequent orders, the dependence on the kind of particle um, that we're scattering is just through an overall factor. Um, and the rest is just an expansion in um, S, T, and U, uh, which are the Mandelstam variable, variables. Um, so um, the expansion looks like this. Uh, it starts with a one here by definition. Um, this is the, the tree level amplitude in supergravity that I showed you in the previous slide. The first correction to it, um, so this is an expansion in, in small momentum, or equivalently is an expansion in the 11-dimensional uh, Planck length, LP. Um, and the first correction to the 4D supergravity um, answer comes from um, an, uh, R, the R to the 4 correction in 11 dimensions, and that's um, because R to the fourth has six more derivatives than the Einstein-Hilbert terms, this is uh, suppressed by a power of L Planck to the six. And equivalently, um, well, it scales like momentum to the sixth power. Um, and then there are uh, loop corrections, um, and then there are corrections coming from um, other terms in the um, M-theory effective action. Uh, the next one here is uh, b to the 6, r to the 4. So this is some contraction of six derivatives and four Riemann tensors. Um, and then we have d to the 8, r to the 4, and then so on. These quantities here, f, d to the 2n, r to the 4, are symmetric polynomials in s, t, and u of degree n plus 3 by dimensional analysis. Because this has 2n plus 6 um, uh, derivatives. Well, 2, 2n plus 8, but there's a correction to the Einstein-Hilbert term, which already has 2. Um, so um, the, these functions of S, T, and U, uh, the, fir the first couple of them are known from type 2 string theory calculations and supersymmetry. And um, this is a work of Michael Green and other people. Uh, at um, F, R to the 4, the, the first one is just S, T, STU divided by 3 times 10 to the 7. The d to the 6 r to the 4 contribution is STU squared divided by 15 times 2 to the 15. 
Um, but beyond this one, the, the other corrections are not known. I should point out that a term corresponding to d to the four, uh, d to the four, r to the four vertex in 11 dimensions is allowed by supersymmetry uh, in 11 dimensions, but it is known to vanish um, from arguments involving string dualities. So what will I do in this talk? I will reproduce the uh, first uh, correction, this f r to the fourth, from a 3D superconformal field theory calculation. So what is the idea? Well, the idea is an old idea. Um, it goes back to these papers uh, in, the, in the late 90s. Um, that uh, flat space scattering amplitudes can be obtained as limits of, of CFT correlators. So for example, if we have a um, CFT3 with some operator phi with scaling dimension 1, like the operators that we'll look at shortly, then um, conformal invariance implies that the four-point function of this operator takes the form of some overall factor times some function of a conformal invariant cross ratios u and v, so u is x12 squared x34 squared over x13 squared x24 squared, and v similar, has a similar expression. And it, it, we can consider this function g of u and v, but equivalently we can also consider its Mellin transform. Its Mellin transform is defined by this formula. It looks a little complicated, but the point is that um, we can either specify what g of u v is, or we can specify what this Mellin amplitude is. M of S and T. So here S and T are just integration variables. Um, okay. And the, um, what was shown in these papers is that from the large S and T limit of the Mellin amplitude of this function M, one can extract a 4D scattering amplitude A of S and T, where S and T now are the Mandelstam variables in uh, flat space um, for the um, particle um, that corresponds, corresponds to this field. Okay. So uh, to obtain the scattering amplitudes of the gravitons and their superpartners in M theory, uh, we should look at the um, corresponding CFT correlators because the Graviton couples to the metric, um, sorry, the graviton couples to the, uh, the metric couples to the stress tensor, um, we should look at the stress tensor multiplet in ABJM theory. ABJM theory is a 3D n equal 8 superconformal field theory, so it has an n equal 8, uh, it has an SO8 R symmetry. And um, here I wrote down the conformal primaries in the stress tensor multiplet. So I wrote down their dimension, their spin, and their SO8, our symmetry representation. Um, at the bottom, there's an operator of spin 2 and dimension 3. This is the conserved stressed energy tensor. And then other operators in this multiplet um, are the supercurrent, the R symmetry current, and some scalar and fermion operators. The superconformal primary of the stress tensor multiplet is a scalar operator of dimension one that transforms into 35 dimensional represent one of the 35 dimensional representations of SO8. Um, you can think of this 35 representation as a rank two traceless symmetric tensor. This is the analog of the 20 prime operators from um, n equal four super Yang melts. And um, so depending on what kind of um, particle we want to scatter, we should look at the corresponding operator over here. But because it's easier to deal with scalars than uh, with um, particles with spin or with CFT correlators of um, operators with spin, we will focus on uh, scattering of the scalars in the um, um, in the n equal uh, supergravity multiplet, or equivalently, the four-point function of these scalar operators of dimension one that transform in the 35 representation of 35-dimensional um, representation of SO8. So these would correspond to gravitons that are polarized in the directions um, uh, orthogonal to the directions in which um, 
to the, to the four directions in which we consider their momentum. So what is the task? Um, to, to obtain the scattering amplitude, we should first determine the Mellin amplitude um, corresponding to this four-point function by solving the superconformal word identity order by order in L plank. And then at each order, we can just take the flat space limit according to the formula that um, is given in, in these papers. And uh, then uh, we figure out what the scattering amplitude is. Um, the expansion in, uh, from the point of view of 11 dimensions is in L plank. From the point of view of the field theory is an expansion in one over N. N is related to L plank, large N, according to this formula. Equivalently, I'll find it convenient to work in terms of a quantity uh, called CT. CT is just the coefficient that appears in the two-point function of the stress energy tensor. This two-point function is determined by conformal invariance up to an overall coefficient. That coefficient is CT. CT is calculable in ABJM theory, and it's related to N. A large N, it goes like N to the three halves. So you can think about having a one-to-one -one correspondence between N and CT. But I will phrase the rest of the talk in terms of CT, not in terms of N. Most of it. Um, so solving the superconformal word identity is a hard task. There's infinitely many solutions. What are we going to do? Um, well, it turns out that if we impose additional conditions, then the number of solutions of the superconformal word identity is finite. What are the conditions that we should impose? We should impose condition that the order LP, L plank to the 2K, this Mellin amplitude should not grow faster than the K plus first power of STNU because this is the growth of the um, corresponding scattering amplitude. And we should also require the right analytic properties that correspond to a bulk tree level within diagram. Under these two conditions, the superconformal word identity has a finite number of solutions. The number of solutions depends on the growth, on, on this power, and the degree of the uh, of the growth at large STNU. So here I made a table um, for a given degree of growth at STNU. Um, I wrote down, so this, this is the degree in the first row, the 11D vertex that corresponds to this in the second row, the scaling in 1 over CT on the third row, and the number of solutions on the last row. So if we require that our Mellian amplitude doesn't grow faster than linear in STNU, then there's only one solution with arbitrary overall coefficient. Um, and then at degree four, there are two solutions. There's just one and another one. At degree six, there's three solutions. There's these two and another one. Degree seven, there's four solutions, and so on. So the superconformal word identity has a finite number of solutions at each order. Um, to determine, to fully determine the Mellian amplitude, we should fix these parameters. Therefore, in order to determine the Mellian amplitude at order 1 over CT, where we have only one undetermined parameter, we should compute one CFT quantity and then match it onto this parameter. To determine the Mellian amplitude to order 1 over CT to the 5 thirds, we should therefore compute, because we have two parameters, we therefore compute two CFT quantities. So, so far, everything could have been done a while ago. Um, what is actually new is um, the fact that we can actually determine two CFT quantities using supersymmetric localization and then fix the Mellian amplitude. Um, so, the CFT quantities um, should be quantities that appear in this uh, it, some relation to this four-point function. So, for example, and they can be coefficients of superconformal blocks that appear in the superconformal block decomposition of this four-point function. Um, should remind you that in a superconformal field theory, um, we can have um, so in general we can we have this prefactor, prefactor times a function of g and u. This function can be expanded in superconformal block. It's it blocks. It's a sum over n equal eight. Um, superconformal multiplets that appear in the S times S OP. And then um, 
So as long as we can determine two of these numbers, then uh, we're good. Uh, now, the um, stress sensor word identity um, uh, says that uh, one of these coefficients, the coefficient of the stress tensor is determined in terms of CT, 256 over CT. And, um, um, and the progress was that using supersymmetry tricks, we can compute one other coefficient in terms of 1 over CT. Um, so this is um, the OB coefficient of another uh, BPS uh, multiplet uh, that appears in the S times S OB. And using these expression, we can, with these expressions, we can determine M of S and T to order 1 over CT to the 5 thirds. And then uh, I was considering list giving the expression, but it's pretty complicated. Um, you can look in our paper. Um, some complicated uh, M of S and T at this order, some complicated expression. You can take the flat space limit of it, and it gives STU divided by R, uh, 3 times 2 to the 7th as expected. And this is a precision test of ADS CFT that goes beyond supergravity. Um, so, um, I guess the, the new ingredient was this computation of OB coefficients using supersymmetric localization. I'll probably skip the details, um, but um, one thing I want to point out is that um, it's usually hard to calculate OB coefficients using supersymmetric um, uh, localization because um, if supersymmetric localization um, reduces a complicated path integral to a finite dimensional integral, and if that's the case, then um, insertions at separated points uh, are not um, are not uh, BPS, so cannot, they cannot be computed using this method. So how are CT and this OB coefficient computed? Well, they're computed from uh, derivatives of the uh, S3 partition function with respect to an n equal 4 preserving mass parameter. And this quantity can be um, computed using supersymmetric localization. OK. Um, why? This S3 partition function with some arbitrary mass parameter is related to these OP coefficients and is explained in, in our. So I'll probably skip over these details and then I'll try to say what else one can do. Can one get, go beyond re reconstructing FR to the fourth? Uh, the answer is I think yes. Um, there are more supersymmetric localization results in ABJM theory that are available and that we haven't used. For example, the partition function um, of the of ABGM theory on S3 has three uh, admits three mass deformations. We only used one, so there, there are more quantities. We can consider partition function on a square sphere, and and so on. Um, so uh, another approach, and maybe in the last few minutes I can uh, discuss this. Another approach is sort of orthogonal. To this would be conformal bootstrap. In general, the conformal bootstrap, using the conformal bootstrap, we can obtain bounds on various quantities. But if these bounds are saturated, then we can actually solve for the CFT data. Um, before showing you conformal bootstrap results, I should remind you something that Clay said, that there are a few families of n equal 8 superconformal field theories. There are some ABJM theories or ABJ theories with superholographic duals, and there are some without known holographic duals, which are these BLG theories. And since I mentioned these OP coefficients CT and lambda B2 squared, I can show you what the conformal bootstrap bounds look in the space of these two, two OP coefficients. In, uh, on the x-axis, of 16 over CT, and on the y-axis is lambda B2 squared. So the supergravity limit is at large CT, so it's close to the origin in, the, in, the, in this axis. And the um, conformal bootstrap bounds show this allowed region that has the form of a triangle. Now, uh, in color, colored dots and lines, I plotted the various known results for um, the um, known n equal h superconformal field theories. So these BLG theories that have no known holographic duals lie completely within uh, the allowed region. But what's interesting is that these theories with known holographic duals come very close to saturating the lower conformal bootstrap bounds. So this is clearly true at very large CT. It's not so clear whether it would be true at finite CT. Um, 
but I can only conjecture that at least one of these theories would saturate the bounds um, at all values of n in the limit of infinite precision. Um, so if this assumption is true, then one can actually extract, reconstruct this four-point function and solve for the spectrum. So this is a plot, under this assumption, a plot of the lowest scaling dimensions of unprotected operators of various spins, spin zero, spin two, spin four, as a function of 16 over CT. Um, these red dashed lines correspond to the supergravity results. So you see that these lines are tangent to these curves. So at least these curves pass that test. And um, this is another example of some semi-short multiplets. And again, uh, this is the supergravity result. And for some, for, for some OP, so this is OP coefficients of semi-short multiplets. And for these ones, for instance, the supergravity result seems to be an excellent approximation for all values of 1 over CT. I don't know, I don't know why, that, why that is true. Um, so using this method, one can potentially in the future compute other OP coefficients. But in order to uh, take this and extract scattering amplitudes and um, 11 dimensions, more precision is needed. Um, so this is just a summary. I want to comment a little bit on uh, various future uh, directions. Um, it's possible to generalize this. Well, one question is whether to generalize, one can generalize this to other dimensions, other four-point functions, less supersymmetry. There was 6D discussed in Shai stock yesterday. Um, whether um, one can study other examples of superconformal field theories. So, so far, I just described scattering amplitudes in supergravity, but you could imagine scattering amplitudes on brains, and maybe there are some setups uh, where one can um, have that. Uh, and also, maybe one can learn about loops um, in ADS um, from this computation. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. Okay. Well, thank you. So, question time? Is there a precise statement of which terms in the in in the high, in the energy expansion in M theory of the S matrix are captured by the uh, supersymmetrically by the supersymmetric uh, observables in the three D theory? So suppose you were able to extract all the possible BPS protected correlation functions from the three from the three, three sphere partition function. What exactly would that capture? Uh, my feeling is that it would be. Um, one would be able to show that d to the 4 r to the, the coefficient of d to the 4 r to the 4 term vanishes, and also determine d to the 6 r to the 4. But uh, probably not beyond that using supersymmetry, because the rest of the terms are not protected in 11 d are not protected. Other questions? Is there anything known about the one loop term, which you said is of order L Planck to the ninth? Um, yes, the, exp the expression uh, of the scattering amplitude is known, but the derivation from the CFT, no, it's not known. So, other question? Okay. If no question, I thank you. So our next speaker is Jie Wang Song. Uh, okay, uh, I'd like to also join other speakers thanking the organizers for uh, organizing such a wonderful conference in this uh, beautiful place of Kinawa and also giving me opportunity to speak here. 
So today I'd like to talk about some joint work that I've been doing with uh, these collaborators, Fred Agarwal, Kasunobu Maruyoshi, Emily Nardoni, and Antonio Sharapa. Um, if, you're inter if you're more interested in my talk, there will be a poster presentation by Prairie. So if you're interested, please go and have a look. So let me start uh, my talk by asking this question. What would be the simplest interacting four-dimensional superconformal field theory with n equals 2 supersymmetry? Since I do not know of any exactly solvable uh, CFT in E greater than 2, I'm asking a much simpler question. Here, the simplest, uh, by the simplest, what I mean is has the smallest number of degrees of freedom, such as having smallest central charge value A. And the answer to this question is likely to be the Arger Douglas theory. And let me briefly review what this Arger Douglas theory is. Uh, it is a theory uh, that describes a particular point in the Coulomb branch of n equals 2 supersymmetric Young Mill theory, or uh, supersymmetric QCD. And it, uh, that special point is, is a point in the Coulomb branch where you get mutually non-local um, charged particles becomes simultaneously massless. And it is described by a strongly coupled CFT. And um, that theory has no tunable coupling. And this, uh, at this point, uh, it, it's, this is usually called Arger Douglas fixed uh, point, and commonly referred to as one of the examples of so called non Lagrangian theory because uh, it contrasts with uh, usual um, super, super conformal QCDs, uh, such as SUN with 2N flavors. There are many generalizations after um, uh, you can construct out of either from string compactifications or class S theories. Um, and its Coulomb phase is relatively well understood uh, thanks to uh, the power, um, power of the cyber gluten geometry. But the conformal phase of this theory is relatively less understood. Um, it, there's, um, there will be, there are some, this, since this is a candidate for a simplest theory, simplest superconformal field theory, so it would be a very natural candidate for a superconformal bootstrap. And um, this is a related work, and we'll hear more about, uh, about it in Madalena's talk later this week. So here are some known analytic properties of the conformal phase of the Arger Douglas theory. And this theory uh, is known to have a Cairo operator of dimension 6 fifth, and this can be easily read off from the cyber gluten geometry. And basically, that was the only information known for almost a decade. And after 12 years since the discovery, Harani Tachikawa and Shapir Tachikawa computed its uh, conformal anomalies for the first time. And it, it was a rather difficult calculation because it, this theory has, uh, is not directly uh, connected to weakly coupled gauge theory. And more recently, it has been shown by, this, uh, by these authors that the central charge uh, the C, the value of C, is actually the minimal uh, value for any interacting n equals 2 superconformal field theory. So indeed, so this, it, this theory is minimal in certain sense. And the further evidence comes from the fact that the 2D chiral algebra associated with the Arger theory, so this chiral algebra has, uh, has been mentioned multiple times in this conference. And the, the chiral algebra, associated to this Arger Douglas theory is given by a non-unitary Pirasoro minimum model, or specifically for this uh, H0 theory, uh, is given by the 2,5 Yang Li model. So, and that's another clue that um, this theory might be the simplest theory you can imagine in n equals 2 setup. So it's kind of an uh, uh, interesting situation that uh, even though we believe this is the simplest uh, in tracking superconformal field theory, it doesn't seem to admit a simple Lagrangian discretion. So there are two main obstacles. That is, uh, it should describe a theory with uh, mutually non-local particles, such as massless monopoles and electrons. And also, secondly, like it has a chiral operator of fractional dimension. So if you insist on writing down n equals 2 supersymmetric Lagrangian, you cannot get fractional dimensions. You only are allowed to have integer dimensions. So probably one way out is to just sacrifice manifest supersymmetry. And this is uh, my proposal. So let me uh, give, give you uh, my proposal. So consider um, n equals 1 gauge theory, where gauge group is given by simple SU2 
having two doublets, so I see two doublets and one adjoint, and two gauge singlets. And they are coupled through this super potential, like this. And I'm suppressing all the indices here. And um, when, once you are given some theory, you should first figure out what the, theory, what the global symmetry that this theory possessed. And uh, this theory has, a, has one anomaly you on global symmetry that in addition to the R symmetry. But the R charge is not fixed by the anomaly constraints or, super or the superpotential. Um, so it actually becomes a one parameter family, but the, the exact R charge at the supercomponent point is fixed through the A maximization principle studied uh, 15 years ago by Intrigator and Wet. So if we apply this A maximization and we, uh, we can compute uh, its superconformal R charge and through the relation between the trace anomalies of R and conformal uh, anomalies, we can compute A and C. And this is exactly the value that I previously showed or for larger subgraph theory. And this, it also contains dimension six fifth operator um, here, this uh, gauge singlet field becomes the operator that parameterizes the Coulomb branch. And one interesting feature of this RG flow is that it has this uh, higher order uh, coupling, this quartic term. So naively, it looks like it's going to be irrelevant, but actually it turns out it gets large anomalous dimensions along the RG flow. So it, the, so it actually becomes relevant as you go to low energy. So schematically, it, it starts its life as an irrelevant deformation, but uh, near under fixed points, actually, it becomes relevant. Uh, it, this, the R charge of this operator becomes less than two near this fixed point. Here's one more example. Uh, now, we, we can consider the same gauge theory, but with different interaction. So I have same matter content, but this time I couple through this superpotential. And you see that um, this interaction will preserve a SU2 flavor symmetry that rotates this uh, two different Quarks. And there's also additional U1 symmetry that can possibly mix with R symmetry. And now by using A maximization, we obtain these values of center charges and um, the dimension for this operator. And this is exactly the value for the uh, so-called H1 or A1 comma A3 are just so close. So, so far I gave you some answer that's, uh, no, uh, so I can do some further checks that is to uh, compute the vacuum moduli space and uh, check if the chiral ring is correct. And indeed, uh, it works. Even though the, modu uh, the moduli space and chiral ring actually gets lo lots of quantum corrections. So upon taking that into account, uh, that seems to agree. And we can also use localization um, to com compute the full superconformal index using this gauge theory description. And it can be compared against completely different method uh, that, that was studied by these people, uh, where they computed certain limits of the superconformal index. And we find uh, perfect agreement up to certain order. So equipped with this um, gauge theory description, we can do uh, something further. That is, for example, we can compute more general supersymmetric partition functions, uh, as Clay mentioned uh, to, uh, this morning. Um, it has been also featured in Sergei Gukov's talk in strings 2017 that he tried to he used uh, our just Douglas theories to come up with some topological invariance of four manifolds. And also similar uh, construction can be done in the one lower dimensions. Then our 4dn equals one theory becomes 3dn equals two. And these people have, um, in their nice work, they have shown that it in S2 n equals four in the IR if you are actually careful about the non-commuting nature of RG flow. So, so, so far I gave you some uh, nice looking answers, but it looked totally random. So you might ask, how did I come up with this uh, Lagrangian that flows to the strongly coupled n equals to CFP? Um, Actually, it, was, it came to us as a surprise. We didn't really aim for it, but we got by some accident. So let me try to explain what we did. Um, so our original aim is to look for some uh, large class of n equals one superconform field theory that is associated with some n equals two um, origin. So let's, start, let's consider some n equals two CFT that has non-abelian global symmetry F. And, uh, 
for n n equals 2 CFT with conserved current, at the bottom component there exists a scalar operator of dimension 2. That's usually called mom moment map operator. And uh, let me add a chiral multiplet, transform as the adjoint of the flavor symmetry, and couple through this superpotential. And this term will explicitly break the n equals 2 R symmetry to n equals 1, and there will be additional U1 symmetry that is preserved by this term. And uh, now we give a nilpotent vacuum expectation value to the singlet field M. That will obviously trigger a relevant RG flow. And uh, generically, you ex expect that this uh, that will flow to some n equals 1 fixed point. And since these nilpotent elements are classified in terms of SU2 embeddings, um, the, the main data that labels this theory would be the n equals 2 theory and the choice of SU2 embeddings. And one important aspect of this nilpotent hexing is that it preserves uh, one of the U1 symmetry, and this can be mixed with R symmetry, so that like superconform R charge has to be determined using A maximization. So that can lead us, some inter lead us to some interesting dynamics. Uh, for example, this, for this deformation uh, for, for a Lagrangian like quiver gauge theory, it can be thought of as like starting from this picture, like adding this uh, gauge singular field M, and then give an expectation value. And that's like a giving a nilpotent mass term for the fundamental quarks here. And that will create this uh, pretty ugly looking figure. So now we investigated a few, uh, a number of examples. Um, and we found uh, something that is surprising that is that for many cases, the uh, thought to be n equals 1 CFT actually becomes n equals 2. The supersymmetry actually gets enhanced at the fixed point. Uh, this gives a rather interesting um, RG flows between two known C n equals 2 CFTs. For example, there is no um, n equals 2 preserving flow between H1 RG Douglas theory to H H0 RG Douglas theory. But we can't have n equals 1 preserving deformation between the two. Also, more interestingly, if we apply this procedure of deformation to the Lagrangian superconformal QCDs, such as SUN with 2N flavors, then we found that it actually flows to uh, the Argers Douglas theory. And so here's some example. So if I consider SUN gauge theory with 2N flavors, this is uh, uh, this one of the simplest example, and the flavor symmetry of this theory will be SU2n times U1, but I'm only considering SU2n because I cannot give a nilpotent value for U1. Uh, and here, uh, this table only gives you a partial list of all possible deformations, and generically, under this deformation, I get a n equals one fixed point with irrational center charges. Uh, but this table, only, uh, I only collected the ones with rational central charges. And you see that some of them looks uh, uh, is identical to the, that of the Argyros Douglas, various Argyros Douglas theory. And there's some like oddballs here with some funny looking numbers. And it has been checked in uh, this nice paper by FTKF that this, these theories actually only preserve n equals one. And you can also check that these theories indeed preserve n equals two by looking at superconformal index. We can repeat the same exercise for SPN gauge group. Uh, this time, the flavor symmetry is SO4N plus 4. And uh, we also see a similar pattern. Most of the, the deformed theory will only preserve n equals 1 because it carries irrational central charges. But there are some um, special cases that give rational central charges. And some of them are known are just Douglas theories. And these uh, like oddballs are like preserve only n equals 1. Now let's consider SON theory. Um, now, SON gauge theory uh, has SPN global symmetry. But quite interestingly, we do not find any non trivial n equals 2 fixed points under all possible deformations up to some high, high rank. Like the, the first entry is actually not doing any deformation, so it, you, those are irrelevant. So it seems that there is some kind of pattern going on. 
So what would be the pattern that we observe here? So in order to explain this, let me uh, give a one-page summary of this uh, chiral algebra associated to, associated to Boolean equals to CFP. Um, in, this, uh, in a beautiful paper by these authors, they found that for any n equals to SCFP, there is a subsector described by a chiral algebra, or more precisely, a vertex operator algebra uh, of a two-dimensional CFP. And any 2D CFP will have virasoro uh, symmetry acting on it, and virasoro central charge is given by that of the C of the 40 theory times minus 12. And also, whenever there is a global symmetry, that becomes uh, a fine cut smoothie symmetry, and the level of the cut smoothie algebra is fixed to be uh, minus half of K of 40. This is, a, uh, this is a quantity that you can compute from the current current query later. And there's some special case where the associated car algebra uh, becomes a simple, um, ju just becomes just a simple cut smoothie. So for example, like SO, uh, SU2 gauge theory with four flavors that has SO8 global symmetry, and is, uh, the corresponding car algebra for this theory is actually SO8 level minus two. Or like Minan Namsensky theory with E6 global symmetry, that the um, associated car algebra is given by E6 with level minus three. So for these cases, the virasoro central charge is given by the Sugawara construction, and the Sugawara central charge is fixed by the, the, the quantities that define by Katsumuri algebra. So that was the background. And so under this uh, n equals one preserving deformation of n equals two theory, we have found that uh, by studying a large set of Lagrangian or non-Lagrangian examples, we find that the supersymmetry gets enhanced to n equals 2 in the IR if and only if uh, this condition is satisfied. Uh, the, this is the first condition, that the UV, the n equals 2 theory that I started with has a 2D algebra central charge given by Sugawara. And the flavor group is of AD type. But it can also have some extra U1 factors, and it can, uh, the C2D can be amended by number of U1s. And it gets enhanced, uh, enhanced to n equals 2 for these two following cases. One, when this nipotent uh, VEF corresponds to the, that of the principal nipotent orbit. So that is a like, maximal uh, nipotent element that you can have. In that case, Susie gets enhanced to n equals 2. Or if you want to choose rho to be something else from the principal, then this uh, 4D n equals 2 theory should saturate the flavor center charge bound uh, derived by these people. So in this case, for example, in, when f is SUN, um, the, 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 the nipotent orbit, the subregular um, one also uh, gives n equals to an fixed point. And we don't understand why that happens. It would be really under, interesting to understand why is this pattern um, holds. There might be, so there's no proof or counterexample of this, um, this criterion, then probably there is a way to understand this, um, maybe from string theory, because these kind of deformation actually can be embedded into string theory. Um, so for the remaining five minutes or so, let me switch the gear to uh, discuss something about n equals one CFP. This is slightly more ambitious because in, with n equals one supersymmetry, we have less analytic control. So there's no analytic bound known so far uh, about the values of central charge A and C. Uh, but thanks to the recent developments uh, on the conformal bootstrap program, um, these people have found some candidate theory that has very small central charge. C goes like 0.11. Uh, this value is like smaller than that of the free vector multiplet. So this is very peculiar. So inspired by this, um, we tried to explore a large set of CFPs that has a Lagrangian description by considering a very simple setup in, with a minimal amount of matter content. That is, just consider adjoint SQCD with a C2 gauge group with one flavor and uh, introduce also some additional gauge singlets um, and explore all possible superposition couplings 
under this, uh, under this setup. Notice that that was a setup that uh, I introduced to uh, get H0 and H1 theory. So this is a pretty simple setup. And since we have minimal amount of matter content, that will gener um, like naturally give us uh, small center charge theories. And here are the result. Um, it was quite surprisingly, personally for me, to find that there are actually a pretty large number of fixed points under this very simple setup. Uh, we found 35 fixed points uh, having very small center charges. Uh, it lies between like 0.3 and 0.6. And these uh, 35 fixed points uh, passes some a number of consistency checks, such as like uh, center charges are greater than zero, and also said that they are not free and they uh, satisfy unitary constraints and in superconformable indices are not trivial. And well, one interesting observation you can immediately see from this plot is that uh, the ratio of A and C lies in some particular line. It's pretty much uh, in a pretty narrow line. Um, the, the mean value looks something like 0.8733 plus minus 0 0.0398. Uh, this is standard deviation. This is my first talk ever uh, mentioning standard deviation. <laughs> so th this is just some amount of data. It's not a lot. It's not like a 50,000, but we can still do some statistics. All right, so let me list some um, prominent examples in this class. So we found that there is this guy that uh, is this H naught star. This is actually a mass deformed uh, theory of Arjus Douglas theory, giving a mass mass term for the Coulomb branch, Coulomb branch operator. And that has the smallest value of A uh, in this class. And this is actually uh, exactly the same theory that's, uh, that has been studied by these authors. And we found that, um, that there are other theories with smallest central charge A with some flavor symmetries. For example, mass deformed version of H1 theory seems to have the smallest value of A among the theories with SU2 global symmetry. And one interesting thing is that we have found one example where the, the, the center charge C is smaller than that of this, this theory. So this guy, so, so T naught here, has a smaller center charge C, but second smallest value of A. On the other hand, this guy has smallest value of A, but second smallest value of C. This was also noticed in an unpublished work by Van Benuti. And uh, communicated privately to us. Uh, there's one wrinkle to this story that is quite interesting. In, in this landscape, uh, we have found some um, candidate fixed point that looks pretty nice and has very small center charge. This has 0.2, which is smaller than that of H naught star. But uh, by looking at superconform index, we found that it contains some unphysical operator that violates unitarity, unitarity constraint. But that, but interestingly enough, that uh, unitary violating operator is not in the usual Kara ring. Usually, um, this thing can happen under along the RG flow. And usually, this means that like, our calculation is wrong, not the theory itself is safe. Be because in many cases, we might actually miss the accidental U1 symmetry. And then that will correct uh, the superconform R charge in the A maximization principle. But, here, this is not, uh, here the, the, the bad operator is not actually in the car ring, and we do not know if there's a, a controllable way of getting rid of that. So it's not clear to us whether this theory is really bad or actually just ugly. Okay, so this time is almost up, so let me summarize. So I've shown you that for, to a given n equals to CFT, with some non-abelian global symmetry group. One can uh, obtain some n equals 1 CFT uh, labeled by the n equals 2 theory and the choice of nipotent VEV. And that will trigger a flow to n equals 1 theory. But for some special cases, uh, the thought to be n equals 1 theory might have enhanced n equals 2 supersymmetry. And I gave you a conjecture that um, when this thing actually happens. And one of the most interesting cases is that if we choose the n equals 2 theory to be superconformal QCD and rho to be the principal type, then this thing flows to Arjus Douglas theory 
uh, thereby giving us a very useful dual description of the original circular steer. And we also found many new uh, simple CFTs with small central charges. And we can systematically construct the simple gauge theory in a rather simple setup. So uh, let me uh, close uh, end my talk by saying some possible future directions. Uh, one of the most pressing questions for me is to understand exactly why and when the supersymmetry enhancement happens. So there might be a string theory way of understanding this. I don't really know. Um, and in some sense, Susie enhancement happens only if the, the, the mother theory that I started with is satis satisfies some minimality condition. So there might be something to do with it. And also, it would be interesting to find other like Lagrangian descriptions for the other non uh, for the other non Lagrangian theories, such as like uh, more general algebraic theories or T N theories or N equals three superconformal theories. Um, th there has been other um, uh, work that achieved some of these. Uh, the, the most important one would be the paper by Gade, Razabad, and Willett, where they first uh, wrote down some N equals one gauge theory that flows to minan nemesinsky E6 theory. And we slightly generalized their construction to E7. Uh, and this construction is, looks rather different from what I described in today's talk. So it would be interesting if there's a like, more generic way of getting this N equals two theory. And also, it's interesting to ask what happens to other dimensions. There has been some interesting work by these authors, such as 3dn equals 1 in answer to n equals 2 in the infrared, or 3dn equals 2 in answer to n equals 4 in the, in the infrared. And their construction looks pretty different from what I presented today. And it would be interesting to uh, see if the, these phenomena can be further generalized. Um, and I'd like to understand what is the minimal n equals one CFT, especially like I'd like to know the fate of this bad looking theory, whether this is really bad or ugly. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. So well, thank you. Uh, any question? So you can start analyzing this thing in reverse. Imagine you're in the n equals two, and you ask, what are the deformations of this theory that preserve n equals one in the R symmetry? Right. And there's a question of whether this is an irrelevant deformation or not. If it's relevant, you're not like you're not going to be likely to hit that. If it's irrelevant, at least within some range, uh -huh. guaranteed to. So it looks to me like this should be one of the things to address here. Um. The question was. Sorry, what, 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 what is the question? So, Take one of your n equals two theories that you find in the infrared. Uh -huh. You make a list of all the operators that preserve n equals one, not n equals two, and the R symmetry that appears in the superconformal right. multiple. You make a list of all of them. Are all of them irrelevant, or is any of them relevant? My uh, hunch is that most of them will be, all of them will be irrelevant. So some of them are uh, definitely relevant because um, I mean, there is this simple mass deformations of the Coulomb, uh, that can be done using Coulomb branch operators. Uh, well, I haven't tried to classify but all that possible. That would break things. the R symmetry. Yes, that will break R symmetry. Yeah, then, but but the rule of the game. One. The rule of the game was that you start with an n equals one theory with a particular R symmetry, and you flow to the infrared. Yes. So, you sit at the candidate infrared point, and you try to see how you would go up. What would be the deformations that preserve that symmetry? And I think you're almost guaranteed that all of these operators would be irrelevant. This would guarantee that if you're just near that point within hands n equals two, if you're just in the neighborhood, you will hit it. Mm -hmm. Because all the def other deformations are, the, the, all, the deforma all the deformations take you in, inward rather than outward. This is something that would be easy to check. I see. Thank you. So uh, just a comment. So similar to what you were describing in terms of nilpotent mass deformations in a work with Heckman, uh, Tachikawa, and Weck in 2010, we showed that uh, you can take Minihan and Michansky n equal to two theories and ma add mass nilpotent mass deformations to get n equal to one theories. Yes, yes. And then we also showed that there are further flows where you can go back to new n equals to, back to n equal to two theories for those. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, for example, in some cases we found you have n equals to one, let's say E6 global symmetry. Mm -hmm. And with some deformations you got in the infrared, 
and equals it to E7. So not only supersymmetry got enhanced, the global symmetry went from E6 to E7. It's just a comment. Uh, I have a more naive question. You've been talking about simple uh, models, but what what do you mean by simplest model? Does it refer to the number of multiplets or uh, smallest value of this A or C coefficient? What, yeah, so, what is so the my definition? simple criterion is that like it has a smallest value of A. So let's move on, and uh, thanks, Brian. And our last speaker is uh, Masakito Yamazaki. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Is that uh, how it works? Oh, yeah, that, that's perfect. Good. Please. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for hosting this wonderful event here in Okinawa. Well, today I'm going to talk about uh, my collaboration with uh, Kevin Costero and Ed Witten. So far, we put out two papers on the archive, one in uh, September and another in February. We are now working on a follow-up, uh, I myself and Kevin Costero, on part three and part four. The difference between the part one, two, and three, four is that the first two papers discuss integrable lattice models. For else, the last two discuss integrable field series, quantum field series. So what I'm going to do today is to explain the contents of parts three and four in such a way that the connection to the first two papers is manifest, so that you get the overall picture of what's happening now. So let me begin with the description of the integrable lattice model in our framework. In integrable lattice models, as useful characterization, of integrability is the Yanbach's equation. And the Yanbach's equation says that uh, the product of R matrices, which are denoted Rij, uh, taken with the different orders are the same. So this is the standard Yanbach's equation. And in the discussion of integrable models, we need extra ingredient, which is the spectral parameter. So these spectral parameters, which are represented as Z1, Z2, Z3 here, are associated with lines and the R matrices depend on the spectral parameters, on the difference of these spectral parameters. And there's a standard story in the integral model literature that if you can solve the Yanbach equation with the spectral parameter included, that ensures that there are infinitely many commuting conserved charges and tensor series integrable. And the big question is how to understand this equation conceptually. Now, there is a very simple idea. But first of all, suppose that there is a series topological along this direction. And you can regard these lines as one-dimensional defect. And then you can move these lines around, etc., uh, to move the, the picture on the left to the right. This almost works, but not quite, because uh, when the three lines collide at a single point, the things become singular. But there is a good way to modify uh, this uh, story by incorporating extra directions. So here, I have the two-dimensional direction. So this is the original two directions, which I was talking about before. And there are three lines, like a line-like defect. But in addition, I have the transverse two manifold, the curve, which I denote C here. And suppose that each line defect is located at a particular point on this curve C. Then this helps the story, because when you move these lines around, it looks like that these three lines collide but they are separated in this direction of the spectral curve. So there is no singularity. And in fact, this spectral curve also helps in explaining the spectral parameters. So I said before that the spectral parameters are the parameters associated with these lines. But that parameter is exactly the position of this line in this uh, direction, spectral curve. So this four-dimensional uh, story 
where we have a combination of topological direction and the holomorphic direction naturally explain the, uh, the structures which appeared in the Ambach equation with the spectral parameter. Now, of course, if you want to discuss any details, then you should specify which is the four, which the, uh, the four dimensional theory. And the Lagrangian for such a four dimensional theory was written down by Kevin Costello in 2013. And, uh, oh, maybe 12, sorry, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> sorry if I made a mistake. Anyway, um, well, um, so this is Lagrangian. And it's a very simple Lagrangian. So first of all, this is the standard chan simon 3 form. But now we are in four dimensions, so we need one more thing. And that, that is a DZ. Or Z is the holomorphic coordinate on the spectral curve. So it's an unusual theory. For example, uh, this has gauge field has four components, usually, because we are in four dimensions. However, because of this DZ wedge term, the, the Z, co Z component of the gauge field drops out. So we have a three-point component gauge connection, whereas the, for, for each component depends on all the four coordinates. This looks like a very peculiar theory, and indeed it is to some extent. However, it turns out that this theory is tedious to a lot of standard uh, uh, chan simon theory, as we will discuss in my forthcoming paper with Cameron. Now, uh, there is a parameter called h bar, uh, which sits in front of the Lagrangian. And what I'm going to do is, is to do a perturbative expansion with respect to this parameter, h bar. So a perturbative expansion around what? Well, I'm going to do a perturbative expansion around isolated classical solutions of the equation of motion. And that sounds intimidating, but in practice it's simple. For example, when the spectral curve C is just a complex frame, then we, I'm going to do the expansion around the trivial connection, namely A equal to zero. And then using the standard rules of quantum field theory, I can do perturbative expansion um, order by order. Um, so uh, now, now we can, we are, we can go, come back to the statistical mechanical models. So we prepare a Wilson line. Uh, this is now a layer of Wilson line, uh, integral of the gauge fit connection uh, of the four-dimensional uh, theory. And then I can make a statistical lattice by uh, putting in many parallel Wilson lines. So here I have chosen the uh, situation where the spectral parameters associated horizontal and vertical directions are the same respectively. And I denoted that uh, those by Z1 and Z2. So this is the setup. Now I'm coming to uh, integrable field series, quantum field series. Well, there is a nice way to, uh, to start with lattice models and go to quantum field theory, which is to take the thermodynamic limit. So this is the, the same picture as before. But now I can make the lattice spacing smaller and smaller, like this, and even smaller so that I obtain uh, quantum field theory in two dimensions. Now, what happened in the process? Well, previously we had Wilson line, which is a 1D defect. But now I have, to, I have infinitely many parallel then. Uh, in, and in the limit, it fills a two-dimensional frame. So the Wilson line is turned into uh, a surface defect, which is a two-dimensional defect inside four dimensions. And what we have now is a coupled system of starting with the four-dimensional bulk together with a surface defect included. So I would say that this, we have a coupled 4D, 2D system. Now, there are two points, and that actually means that there are two surface defects. This is very easy to see if you go back to the original uh, uh, integrable uh, lattice models. So in the integrable lattice model, there are two different types of Wilson lines, one in horizontal, and one is the, this is horizontal and vertical, located at different points on the spectral curve. Which means that if you take the limit, well, of course, they are, they, they are each turned into surface defect, uh, located at different positions, z1, z2. So in this process, we have two surface defects. The question is, what are the difference between the two surface defects? Well, again, if you go back to this uh, discrete lattice models, then it's obvious they spread in different directions, one horizontal and another vertical. And in the language of gauge field, that means that they couple to different components of the gauge field. So here, I have chosen the light cone coordinate, W and W bar, on this R2. And say, for example, here in this vertical direction, it couples to the W bar component of the gauge field, whereas on this horizontal direction, it couples to the W component of the gauge field. So this is the term in the, uh, this is the Wilson part of the Wilson line, uh, which appears uh, 
uh, in the original integrable lattice models. And this structure should be preserved even after taking the sum dynamic limit, uh, which means that uh, this thing, the surface defect correspond to located to this point Z1, should couple only to the W bar component, and hence the current should also only have W component. And uh, so, which means that the surface, the theory on the surface defect is chiral. You can say the same thing for this anti-chiral defect, and uh, uh, this the, another defect, and that's going to be anti-chiral defect. So this is the type of the coupling uh, which one might expect, and there is a factor of h one of h bar which I included, and this h bar is the same h bar uh, as in the h bar for the four-dimensional bar Lagrangian. So we have one of h bar in front of the whole action of the combined 4D 2D system. Now. I have explained the setup, and we arrived at the coupled 4D 2D system, one chiral and another anti-chiral defect. And once you arrive this understanding, you can forget about the uh, integrable lattice model structure and just study the system. But I haven't asked the, uh, answered the fundamental question of why the system is integrable in any sense. There is a simple answer. So let's define this L, L of Z, uh, as this thing. So this is just a W and W bar component of the gauge field. But now I'm regarding that uh, as, as a one form in R2, not in the four dimensions. Which means that Z, this uh, coordinate in the extra direction, looks like an auxiliary parameter. So that's, that's I denote what I denote by L of Z. Now it turns out that this, uh, this operator satisfies a flat connection equation. And this is because if you compute this, and you find that it's proportional to W W bar component of the gauge field, but this is zero due to the equation of motion from the four-dimensional gauge theory. So the four-dimensional theory was chan simon theory, and it's, it's, it's really topological along this R2 direction, which I'm talking about. Uh, so the equation of motion means that the field string is zero. So on shell, it's, it's a flat connection. Now, if you get the flat connection, there is a standard story in, quant uh, in the integral models of producing infinitely many conserved charges, uh, which is to take uh, the first order the exponential of this thing, and then, since it's a function of z, uh, you can expand with this, with this parameter z. And each coefficient, which I denote the qn here, creates the law of the uh, conserved charges. So they are typically non-local conserved charges and generate infinite dimension symmetry underlying in, uh, integrable models. So this is how you see the uh, integrability, at least classically. Now, in our setup, we can make this a little bit more uh, physical. So namely, this was the expression I was writing. This I had previously L. But L is nothing but the gauge field component uh, along W, W bar direction. Which means that this object, which I'm expanding with, so I ex define this object and I'm ex expanding with this to Z to define conserved charges. This is nothing but the Wilson line uh, uh, of the four-dimensional gauge field. But now, uh, lapping the S1 where I have, we start with R2 and then compactify one of the spatial directions to have R times S1. So motto is that, that we have integrable because we have a lux operator which comes from the four dimension Wilson line. So in a sense, the, just the existence of Wilson line which is already in the theory explains why the theory is integrable. Now, uh, this, this is a setup where we have a coupled 4D 2D system. But of course, you might want to compare with something known. And people use the two-dimensional description. So in order to make the connection, we need to uh, integrate out the fuse along this C, the spectral curve direction. And if you integrate the fuse along this direction, you should obtain some two-dimensional theory, purely two-dimensional theory, uh, which I might call the effective two-dimensional theory. So let's do this procedure of integrating our fuse along this C. In order to discuss this, first one might need to know uh, what are the zero modes around this C. And since that we have a coupled 4D 2D system, they might come either from 4D or 2D. It turns out that in our setup, uh, it's, uh, uh, we, there are no zero modes coming from four dimensions. And this is because uh, we have chosen the setup in a sense. So we are expanding around isolated solution of equation of motion, which means that there are no modules around C. 
But you can consider a setup where there are zero modes along the C, and there are 40 zero modes. Uh, but that's known to correspond to some generalization of the Young Bucks equation, known as the dynamical Young Bucks equation. So let me not discuss this. And th therefore, all the zero modes should come from 2D surface defect. The 2D surface defect has its own series, so they might be zero. Well, they, they have all these uh, degrees of freedom there. Now, at this level, the, the surface defects are separated with each other, and they don't talk with each other yet. However, um, there are uh, in interactions between the different surface defect series because you can exchange the four-dimensional gauge bosons. And this is one of the simplest three-level diagrams you can write down, where this is a chiral surface defect, and the other is anti-chiral surface defect. Um, so in the chiral defect, there is a coupling to uh, a chiral uh, current, and anti-chiral defect, uh, there is a coupling to anti-chiral defect. And here, I exchange the gauge boson by a propagator. So this is a very simple uh, gauge theory computation. Uh, well, it turns out that this is the only diagram contributing. Oh, sorry, not on the left. Sorry, I forgot to remove this. This is the only diagram uh, contributing to a tree level. Uh, for example, you might think that there might be a uh, vertex in the, in the bulk. But it turns out that uh, uh, if you, if you couple the anti chiral defect, you have AWW here. And if you want to contract the indices in between, you need a vertex like AWW bar. So name two W bars. Uh, but there is no such a term in Chan Simon theory. You need a Z component here. Anyway, there is a simple di diagrammatics will tell you that uh, the previous diagram, so this diagram, is the only diagram contributing. And you can say that, OK, let's compute it. Uh, but there is a nice way to compute it. Uh, well, of course, we did the computation, but uh, there is a nice way to explain this computation. So instead of computing this diagram in itself, let's again go back to integrable lattice models. And then this surface defect came from uh, uh, infinitely many parallel Wilson lines. So let's go back to Wilson lines and see what we get. Um, in this picture, uh, there are two Wilson lines, uh, which are orthogonal with each other. So if you project this picture down to R2, what you get is, uh, is this crossing of Wilson line. And as I explained at the beginning of the introduction, uh, so when two Wilson lines cross, there is an R matrix associated with it at the intersection. So that means that this diagram is the first leading correction to this R matrix. Um, so let's uh, see here, I denoted the R matrix of capital R and Z bar, uh, H bar. And I'm expanding this with this with the H bar to, uh, to define the first non-trivial correction. And in integral model literature, this type of expansion uh, is known. And this first leading non-trivial coefficient is known as the classical R matrix. So this means that this diagram, and hence essentially the same diagram, this diagram, is nothing but the classical R matrix, which I denoted small r of z. Now you can write down the effective theory. So first of all, the effective theory obviously has the Lagrangians coming from defects, namely the Lagrangian for the chiral defect and anti-chiral defect. But they talk with each other through this current, uh, together with this uh, small r, which is the classical r matrix. So this is the Lagrangian. Now, uh, you can also convert the Lux operator to this effective description. So the Lux operator was AW and the AW bar. And in the effective description, it means that there is extra vertex in the bulk. So you do a similar computation, and you find that this is the Lux operator you find in the effective series. Well, of course, once you find the, uh, uh, this explicit Lux operator, you can just check yourself that it's, uh, it satisfies the flat connection equation uh, by imposing the equation of motion for the effective two-dimensional series. If you're a little bit skeptic still, uh, I can go to a special case, where the rational case, uh, where the spectral curve is a complex plane. And this classical matrix, up to some group theory factor, is just the one over z, where z is this part argument here, the spectral parameter. And the Lux matrix uh, we, we, we had reduces to a standard formula known in the literature, uh, where uh, this thing has a pose at uh, two points, uh, 1 and minus 1. And these correspond precisely to the location of the surface defect. So, uh, so some of the standard formulas are reproduced in this way, uh, purely from quantum field theory logic. 
Now, let me discuss a little bit more detail what kind of series we get. And, and a good example is the, well, okay, so of course that depends on what kind of surface defect we consider. But the simplest surface defect is the chiral, anti-chiral, free fermion. And then, of course, we get this thing, but there is a four fermion interactions. And they reproduce the gross nibu type models. And uh, uh, so, uh, so it's, it's the, the simplest case. The defect is completely simple. The free fermion just coupled to the bulk four dimensional gauge field, and then it reproduces this theory. Together with the lux matrix, and hence the integrability. And our framework is sufficiently flexible to allow for various generalizations. For example, I can change the spectral curve from C, complex plane, to C star, or elliptic curve, et cetera. And by just changing the spectral curve means that we go to more complicated integral models. And these C correspond to so-called trigonometric or elliptic integrable models. For example, this one imposes a theta function. Another generalization is consider a, a surface defect uh, corresponding to the beta gamma system as a surface defect. Then uh, we can reproduce a variety of sigma models uh, from our construction. We can also consider uh, multiple defects. Here I have two chiral defects and three anti-chiral defects, and we have some interesting uh, Lagrangian, which is still integral. Now, uh, well, in the rest of the time, let me come to the issue of quantum integrability. So classically, I explained that the Lux matrix and the series is integrable, but quite often, such integrability can be broken by quantum effect. And to do, discuss that, we first need to quantize the theory. And obviously, I need to make sure that the anomalies cancel, which you can discuss, uh, in, uh, assuming certain conditions are satisfied. But let's, for the, in sake of time, let's assume that, uh, uh, that the anomalies cancel. Then how to see the quantum integrability? Well, let's come to the classical story. And I said before that lux operator counts because we have four-dimensional views online. Now, I consider a variant of the setup. So previously, I had uh, uh, the cylinder and a uh, line lapping this circle. But instead of that, let's consider flat R2, and then include this whistle line here, at some point of the spectral curve, different from the location of the two surface defect. So this is just one whistle line. Uh, but the now point is that we want to regard this operator, uh, this is pass over the exponential of this gauge field along this pass, as an operator from uh, x equals the spatial direction minus infinity to infinity. So this is operator. Now, why does this help? Let's consider two such operators. Um, now, these are Wilson lines, so you can smoothly, uh, without any problem, you can move this around. It looks like there is a singularity, but just as before, they are located at different points of the spectral curve, so you can move this around with any problem. Or if you move this farther, there, you can say that there is a crossing at infinity, and then another crossing at infinity. Otherwise, it's parallel. Uh, which means that we have this equation. Uh, we have two operators, and uh, it's the same thing, but with different ordering, uh, except that there is a twist corresponding to the R matrix. And this equation is known as the RTT relation, uh, the, because we have R and TT. And our TT relation is actually one of the definitions of the Youngians, or uh, the quantum trigonometric counterpart, uh, which these are the symmetries, infinite dimensional symmetries, underlying a uh, uh, quant quantum integrable system. So this explains uh, the our TT relation and why such infinite dimensional symmetries are present. And the final remark is that uh, this relation, uh, again, it's useful to go back to integrable lattice models and what the counterpart is. You go back to integrable lattice model, instead of, again, surface defect, we just have one Wilson line. And this is the, and we have the exactly the same type of relation, uh, TT equals to RTT. And, uh, and this relation is known as the uh, same name, RTT relation, but for discrete uh, integrable lattice models. And you can read this picture literally by, well, there are Wilson lines and smoothly move it around. Uh, just as I explained at the beginning. But now I'm in changing the interpretation uh, that namely, this Wilson line, horizontal Wilson line, is regarded as an operator acting on the state on this vertical Wilson line. And that's how you extract the generator. And this is what we discussed in part two of our paper. 
So well, the, the discussion argument for quantum integrability, which we provided in part four of our paper, uh, can be thought of as a continuum uh, field theory version of what the, the RTT relation discussed in part two. And our 4D framework uh, is sufficiently flexible and says uh, uh, a lot more. Uh, and for, for example, some local conserved charges as opposed to non-local charges, which I mentioned, and also renormalization group pro and other things. And for all these details, please wait for our paper, uh, which I hope will appear soon. Um, so here's the summary. Um, so uh, the, the, the thing we want to discuss is the integral volatis model or integrable field series, quantum field series in two dimensions. And well, people typically look at these things and then discuss a lot of interesting structures. And that's amazing that there are so many wonderful results have been obtained so far. But my point here is that instead of looking at here at the purely two dimensional object, it's very useful to go to four dimensions where we have this vector curve. And the, spectral, the presence of this vector curve geometrizes some of the information and makes conceptually clear many of the ingredients and seems to uh, you need result uh, in integrable uh, lattice models and integrable field series. So this is the end of my talk. And usually, I end my talk by saying thank you uh, or arigato gozaimasu. But uh, here, this is a conference in Okinawa. So I think I should thank you in the local language, uh, which is Nifei Deviru. Thank you. Yeah, very good talk. And so question time. I'm a little confused about the defects. So you yes. had horizontal defects giving chiral uh, defects yes. and vertical lines giving you the anti-chiral one. Yes. But I could have imagined an angle Mm -hmm. And so I would get a family of defects labeled by an angle. Yes. And so that means that, first of all, you can go from chiral to anti-chiral continuously. Yes. 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 And secondly, you can have all of them together. Mm -hmm. What would it mean in your language? Yeah, you let's see. So the, I, I motivated that well, well, I will talk specifically about chiral and anti-chiral defects because I want to explain things in such a way that the connection to lattice models and field series manifests. However, the story I present itself uh, works for a in fact, very general class of defect. So namely, the assumption that the defect is chiral or anti-chiral was not necessary. So you can just start with the 4D theory with various defect inserted, chiral, anti-chiral, or even low-dated. So what, what happened? What do you get in field theories? What kind of field theories we get? Because the one was yeah. Z and one was Z bar. If I yes. get different angles, 45 degree, mix them with that. Right. Uh, what kind of? Yeah, so that, that's, that means that there is going to be, so when you, when you compute, that, that changes the sum of the computations. For example, suppose that it's a completely non-chiral defect, like a, you can couple to free, free boson, for example. And then that means that there is a, 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 a W and W bar component the gauge field couples to that. And that means that there is a new, uh, new, new Feynman, Feynman diagram you should sum up. So some of the, the expression for the two, effective two-dimensional theory I presented is specifically for that chiral anti-chiral defect, but there is a generalization for non-chiral defect. My question is, is it, are, these known, new, are these known or new integrable quantum systems? Well, uh, the, uh, well, I believe that they are new integrable models, but there is uh, so much literature in integral field theory, so probably I need help from some people in the audience as to, as to the question of why some of the constraints. But it looks like that the constraint, yeah, in fact, almost all the theories, you can take any, almost any 2D surface defect and couple it to four dimensions, and it seems to give, well, they, they do give integral models, certainly classical. It's a little bit subtle, more quantum mechanical, and they seems to be new. Uh, but to declare if it's new or not, I, I think I need more confidence as to the literature. Uh, you, you, you mentioned curved beta gamma systems uh, on the surface defect. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the first part. Curved beta gamma system? Yes, that's right, yes. Yeah. So is there any restriction on the kind of target space you can consider? Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, the first comment is that uh, if you have a, a classical, if you have wor only, only, uh, worry only about classical integrability, there are very few restrictions. Well, you need a Hermitian matrix, et cetera, and uh, that's a requirement. But strictly speaking, we have some technical conditions. I'm not completely sure if you can realize all the, all the target space with the Hermitian matrix, but uh, almost oh, sounds, looks almost like that. Now, if you come into quantum case, and then uh, there are obstructions. For example, uh, there is a, a first Pontryagin class anomaly associated with the uh, beta gamma system, which people discuss. Uh, so, uh, so, so there are some obstructions for quantizing the beta gamma system. And, uh, and that's reflected there. And a good example is the CPN model. So CPN model, where n is two or greater, 
uh, is known to be classically integrable, but uh, people, Lucia and others, sorry, um, there are a lot of many people contribute to subjects, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, a lot of people uh, have studied that in the 70s or maybe 80s or so, and, and then found that they're, they're not integrable quantum mechanically. And that questions the fact that the uh, beta gamma system with the target space CPN uh, has this uh, obstruction and two quantization. So that's the quantization for quantizing the surface defect itself. Now, there's an extra condition coming from quantizing the whole coupled 4D 2D system, and that puts some, for example, then that puts some restrictions on what kind of uh, uh, defects you can put on, and that gives extra conditions. So it's a little bit subtle, and I still don't have a complete story yet, uh, but I can, in principle, I can analyze it one by one. So, 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 one more question. So, the spectral curve that you have considered so far is flat, right? So, it's yes. a complex plane, the yes. cylinder, right. and, yes. and, 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 yes. and the torus. Yes. So, you're talking about higher genus spectral curves, yes. and that's, that's curved. Yes. So, do you need to modify the theory to make it holomorphic in those two directions? Well, let's see. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. And in fact, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, we, well, in fact, we argued in the part one, and one of our paper that these three are the only possibilities. And, and the reason was the follows. So uh, you can try to well, replace this uh, DZ, the one form, by another, in general, one, some one form. So some general down form, let's call it omega, which is Simons. And there we argue that uh, in order to uh, have a well-defined, uh, 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 well, well, we, we, we well-defined uh, uh, problem of solving, well, let's see, we need an elliptic boundary condition for the classical equation of motion, and that picks up the, uh, imposes the condition that there are no, uh, uh, no zeros to this one form, and that uniquely fixes the three possibilities. However, uh, there is a way to modify the condition uh, by, uh, by slightly tweaking the boundary, uh, boundary condition. And, uh, and that's discussed in part three of our paper, and with that we can now realize the, uh, some uh, uh, two-dimensional quantum field theory examples of the models with higher genus spectral curves. Uh, I know that there are some works uh, by, for example, uh, Krichba, Nov Novikov, and other people about such things, and those might be related. Uh, but that, that, those examples are peculiar, but have interesting connection to Hitchin system, for example. So I think it's a very interesting study then. So uh, when you were talking about the, the quantum field here, um, you, uh, you were on the plane, so you were in infinite volume for the two-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, well, so let's see. Yeah, in fact, uh, the, the spectral curve direction. So we, in, when we discuss the effective theory, in fact, we need to add the infinity uh, so to the spectral curve to, so, so that it becomes a sphere. And then the dimensional reduction are along, the, uh, along that direction. So that's how, what we do. Can you put the, uh, the effective theory in finite volume to compute the spectrum and so on? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, we haven't really computed the spectrum or things like that. I mean, to explain the integrability in itself was the uh, most conceptual thing. But the, but the, R, the R2 direction where the integral uh, field theory is defined, it can be taken to be finite, uh, if it's an infinite direction, so just R2. In some discussions, uh, for example, when I discuss some const particular construction of local charges, etc., cetera, I, def I compactify one of the directions. But for the most part, it's just uh, 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 yeah, non-compact R2. Well, of course, you can try to do other things, like imposing boundary condition, and then see what is the meaning of that in our framework, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of interesting questions. And, uh, and for, for example, if you have boundaries, there is a generalization of the Ambach's equation, uh, known as the RKK, KKR relation. So anyway, so, uh, so there are a lot of interesting things which you can discuss. But uh, uh, so far, I'm busy finishing wrapping up the story. Thanks. OK, two more questions. Okay, so let's close uh, the morning session and, uh, and let's thank all the speakers this morning. Thank you. Thank you.